All right, folks, uh, nine o'clock. Uh, the webinar has officially started. And welcome to the hemp conference, uh, Lessons from the Hemp Field, Navigating Opportunities and Risks of the New Market. My name is Rex Dufour. I work for the National Center for Appropriate Technology, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. And I manage the California office in Davis, California. Uh, we've got a really informative program for you today and some really good uh, presenters. But before I get to them, um, I want to acknowledge that uh, this event and um, three subsequent events um, are financed and supported by uh, the Extension Risk Management Education folks up in Washington State who provided funding for this. Um, originally, these events, two in California, two in Oregon, were going to be in person and with COVID, everything went off the rails. And so uh, depending on how COVID infections go, the future events, two in Oregon and one additional one in California, may be virtualized. Um, my colleague, Ann Beyer, uh, will be monitoring uh, the, uh, the chat function for any questions, but also she has uh, posted a link to an evaluation of this event. It's an opportunity for farmers to provide feedback about what topics and issues they need more information about. And we'll take those, that feedback very seriously to inform the content of future events. So please, uh, go to that link and fill it out. It'll only take about five minutes of your time. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Farmer Resource. Um, this is, uh, NCAT manages uh, the ATRA project, which is a National Sustainable Ag Information Service. Uh, it's a great informational resource for farmers and ranchers. It has information in all kinds of formats, so you can digest this information in whatever format you prefer. And we also run a couple toll-free helplines for farmers where you can ask any question about sustainable or organic production or marketing of crops and livestock, and we'll get an answer back to you uh, within a day or two as, you know, as soon as we can. And this service is free of charge. Um, so without further ado, um, the first speaker uh, today is Dr. Gordon Jones. Uh, and on the right, you can see today's program. Um, but Dr. Jones will provide a brief overview of hemp. And then after Dr. Jones, we'll have our farmer panel, Akasha, Phil, and Sandor. And they'll talk about what they do and we'll ask them some questions. And there will be an opportunity for um, you folks, you participants, to ask some questions as well. And we'll try and get to as many of those as we can. And the last session, we'll have Locke Fan of CDFA, the California Department of Food and Ag, talk about uh, rules and regs. And then uh, NCAT's uh, Jeff Shizinski will talk about crop insurance options for hemp. So uh, again, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, uh, please post them in the chat section and Ann will let me know and uh, we'll try and get to them. And let me introduce to you uh, Dr. Jones and I'm going to stop my share and have Dr. Jones go ahead and start his share. Um, Dr. Gordon Jones is an Extension Agriculture faculty at the OSU Southern Oregon Research and Extension Center located in the Rogue Valley in Oregon. He serves as part of the Production Agriculture Research Consortium within the Global Hemp Innovation Center based in, at OSU. Uh, Gordon conducts research and teaches extension classes and provides technical assistance around pasture, hay, and hemp management, as well as soil fertility, cover crops, and pesticide stewardship in Jackson and Josephine counties. And we're very pleased to have him today. And Dr. Jones, please uh, go ahead and set the stage. Thank you. Thanks Rex, Rex for that nice introduction. Can you just see my screen uh, properly? Yes. Great. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you for the uh, invitation and the nice introduction. Um, I'm a extension agent in Southern Oregon. This is gonna be a presentation that while the title says overview of hemp, it's probably more of an overview of hemp productions and things that I've learned and seen over the past several years um, that uh, the area that I work in happens to be a hot spot of uh, hemp in Oregon. So a few basics on hemp to start with. Hemp is a crop that has been around for a long time and is just facing a, uh, 
a resurgence and maybe a gold rush of uh, interest once again. Here's a document, you can't quite see the date on that, um, is 1898, where in addition to discussing feeding artichokes to pigs, there are some discussions of uh, hemp, and, uh, hemp and flax uh, there as part of this bulletin. And that's something that uh, there is some old literature on hemp and slowly but surely we're gaining new sort of scientific and extension knowledge about hemp. Um, but they're unlike most any crop, you can go and do a Google search or a library search and find a hundred years worth of research on basically any economically important crop. That's not the case for hemp. That we've got to go back really pretty far in order to, to find good information. And that really is a different beast of an animal where the resurgence and in interest in hemp uh, recently has been one that is a um, essential oil uh, cannabinoid driven market rather than seed or fiber. But we'll talk about some of those different uses. And uh, so we have this funny distinction. You can't look at a plant or smell a plant um, and be able to make a determination if it's hemp or it's marijuana. That's like a chemical assay that needs to be done. And there's this legal definition of 0.3% uh, total THC in that plant is the dividing line between hemp and marijuana. And I think that's a relatively arbitrarily selected uh, threshold, but it's what we've got. And that's, um, I think, a challenge that the growers um, deal with and will continue to deal with, uh, particularly in the CBD hemp market. So uh, let's see, I arrived in Southern Oregon in the summer of 2017, and we had a few thousand acres of hemp growing. And in the um, in 2018, there were a few thousand more. These are uh, Oregon Department of Agriculture registered hemp acreage across the whole state. We had a few thousand more um, acres in 2018. Come December of 2018, there was the passing of the U.S. Farm Bill, and that uh, legalized uh, hemp production across the country and also like lifted some restraints that uh, faculty like myself were under at the university um, previously had not been uh, permitted to work on hemp because of legal uh, constraints around the university's fu federal funding. And so it's got uh, into hemp in 2019, and so did the rest of the world. Um, Oregon saw a dramatic increase in registered hemp acreage and explosion in uh, interest in the crop and change in land use like I've certainly never seen before, and I'm not sure I'll ever see again um, the real dramatic uh, change in our landscape. And in Oregon, registered acreage dropped again somewhat in 2020. And I think as time goes on, you will hear some reasons about why that, um, that makes sense that there was this dynamic flux of um, uh, registered acreage of, of hemp in Oregon. So here's just a map of Oregon and all the orange dots are the locations of individual fields. So my two counties are uh, these two Jackson and Josephine counties in the southwest corner of the state. We've got about a quarter or a third of all the registered hemp uh, acreage in the state in those two counties. And so while I have a general agriculture appointment and I'm trained as like a forage agronomist, I spend a bunch of time doing hemp because it's a, um, it is the hot topic of my time and location. So uh, stepping back into just hemp in general, I tend to think about the sort of like harvestable products that come from hemp. And as we like sort of zoom out across the world and across history, I think about four general uh, classes of material. Uh, those are seeds that are for oil or for protein. Um, go find my grandfather's Morrison's Feed and Feeding uh, textbook from 1946. And there's a little section in there on feeding hemp seed meal. Um, Currently, however, it's illegal to, um, or is not permitted to feed uh, hemp or hemp byproducts to livestock. Think about fiber, we know that there's, um, hemp produces a valuable fiber. It's um, strong and um, relatively easy to produce, is um, particularly valuable in maritime systems, um, is resistant to degradation by salt water. And uh, the recent boom in hemp has not been these two things. Um, there's a little bit of uh, hemp seed and hemp fiber production that goes on in the United States, but it really is relatively minor. And the explosion of interest that we saw was either hemp for smokable flour or hemp for biomass for extraction. And so I'm really gonna focus on these two things um, because that is the production that I think we mostly see in the United States and certainly is the vast majority of the hemp that we see in Oregon. So I'm just going to sort of now like show you a bunch of pictures and walk you through a production cycle. Um, let me make sure I can see the time in front of me. And, whoops. 
Okay. So hemp is uh, st uh, started from seed and this uh, seed industry is uh, one that uh, we see production sort of in a number of parts of the country, but is uh, relatively nascent to, to my mind. Seeds are pretty expensive on the order of a dollar a piece and are generally uh, feminized, which means that the mother plants are treated with silver thiosulfate. Um, hemp is a dioecious plant. There are male plants and female plants. And when we're harvesting for uh, cannabinoids or essential oils, that the uh, currently accepted wisdom is that we need unpollinated female flowers. And so uh, feminizing seeds means that you have like 98 or 99% of those seeds that are produced will make, uh, will grow female uh, plants and uh, reduce the risk that your crop is seeded or pollinated. Uh, we, as I sort of talk through this system, it, uh, it feels to me like hemp growers, at least in my part of the world and much of what I see uh, elsewhere, have adopted a model of agriculture that is one that feels to me like it comes out of illicit um, marijuana production, that we have a really intensive system. To my mind, what the system that I'll describe is like just about the most expensive way you could grow a crop and make sense maybe if you're like in the woods of Humboldt County and you've got 20 plants that you need to baby each one of them. Um, as we scale up into larger um, multiple tens of acres in uh, in terms of field size, I'm not sure those practices all make sense. But anyway, so uh, we've got seeds that are a dollar a piece that are generally feminized that have been bred to produce high um, content of cannabinoids, probably mostly CBD. There is some interest in uh, cannabigerol or CBG. These are uh, started in a greenhouse, um, are then transplanted out into the field. Uh, in my part of the country that happens in June or July, sometimes all the way into August. And um, so we have this transplanted system and uh, plastic mulch is a uh, sort of hot topic in the uh, hemp world where, where I work. The plastic mulch is the one, sort of most common weed control strategy um, and I think works pretty well for many producers that um, as part of a system of weed control can uh, grow a really, um, can grow a nice crop. It does have the challenge that um, the material that's primarily used is not recyclable in any way. You're putting down between one and 200 pounds of plastic per acre, and that goes into the landfill at the end of the season. And while growers are using uh, plastic mulch, um, we find that some of them rely on that solely as a tool. And so here's an image that's kind of hard to see, but this is beds of plastic mulch that they have planted hemp plants into, but have made no additional effort to control weeds. And so the weeds grow. Um, and maybe that would be another point to make that um, my sense of the hemp industry, particularly in Oregon, is that we've seen an influx of people, of uh, producers who don't necessarily have uh, sort of like long history of crop production or field scale agriculture. And so um, I think as we click through um, some of these pictures, you'll see that it's like sort of from every angle. Some, in some cases, people are like missing the mark a little bit um, in a way that makes sense for a new crop that has a lot of new producers in it. So this crop I think was harvested, but really seems like a, a loss to me. That said, we have a number of producers who don't use plastic mulch and that can be quite successful. The picture on the left here is a, uh, craft smokable flower grower and uh, carefully manages where and how much he irrigates, uh, plans to have hand crews go through and can grow a pretty uh, clean crop. Uh, as compared to this one, and sorry, the picture's kind of uh, blurry here, grew without plastic mulch, really like soaked their, uh, soaked the whole field with their drip irrigation system prior to planting and ever, even before they planted it, were battling, battling weeds and so, uh, in this sort of hazy picture, I think they've gotten six or eight people out weed whacking this, what ended up being like a 15 acre field and went through two or three times. And um, they did harvest a crop, but it looked to me from the roadside, this was across the road from my office, uh, looked to me more like a crop failure than a success. And so some tidbits on sort of site selection and other things that I've seen. We've got folks who, um, are growing on hillsides, which I think is an iffy practice for uh, annual cropping systems, but then uh, is worth pulling over and taking a picture for because they've set their rows up and down the the hit of the slope of the hill, and that's um, one of those things of like I I would have thought uh, 
most folks who are engaging in this scale of agriculture would have had the memo about soil erosion from a century or more ago about the, the risk that that um, soil moves downhill. We see some like adaptation kind of questions. One of the only like really specific recommendations we get about where do we grow hemp is that we need freely drained soil. We, um, hemp doesn't will not grow with uh, wet roots. And so here's a wet patch in a field. The field otherwise looks really very good, but that was the patch you can see is sort of like a muddy tire track there. Um, those hemp plants died. Um, other funny thing that's like such a like a desperate interest to get into the industry in 2019 that doing some other practices that were sort of head scratching. This is kind of a funny picture. So that we have lots of pear orchards in Southern Oregon and somebody bought a pear orchard, cut all the limbs off the trees, didn't even have time to take the trees out, set down their uh, plastic mulch and planted what are some like really very leggy um, hemp starts late in the season. And one of the things that we know about hemp is that it is a bioaccumulator or a phytoaccumulator, uh, good at like pulling various elements and compounds out of the soil. And so this kind of thing really has me scratching my head. This was a production orchard two years prior and they were using these like sort of so uh, uh, durable soil herbicides to control weeds and a whole heap of insecticides. And particularly where we have this hemp following orchard production, has me scratching my head about what, what all is getting pulled up by those hemp plants and where exactly does it end up in the plant? And there is some research on that. It's mostly fiber hemp out of Canada or Europe or um, Asia. And so that's one of those things that I expect we'll learn more about as time goes on. Um, let's see, some other things that I've seen out in the field, um, at least early in the season when plants like look kind of iffy, they're root bound, that they're almost always root bound. Like every plant I pull out of the ground or like go and like, this is like someone's root ball from two seasons ago that just as bound up as possible. And that's just, a, I think a step of mismanagement going from the greenhouse out into the field. Um, but really you're gonna have a hard time getting water and nutrients into a plant that has like a golf ball size um, root ball. We've got questions, but not very good answers on things like soil fertility. The um, hemp growers who have been marijuana growers tell me that you like wanna come want to hold back on fertilizer at the end of the season and you expect to see some yellowing or chlorosis of of the leaves as maturation takes place and that's how you know you're at the right level but I guess I scratch my head on what exactly does that mean how um, drive by a field that uh, has yellow leaves at the base of the plant which seems like remobilization of nitrogen or nitrogen deficiency to my eye and this is in a variety trial we conducted at the research station where um, really are showing some nutrient uh, deficiency symptoms, but we don't have good information on sort of like field recommendations for uh, fertilizer for hemp, that there's a little bit of work that's uh, starting to be done, but, in a, but not in the way that we really can for lots of other crops. We see uh, insect pests in this part of the world of a whole range of sorts, but I think the one that probably appears to be the most economically important is the corn earworm that uh, shows up and is, uh, will like burrow into those uh, flower buds and in some cases will like sort of uh, will nip the stem or chew through the stem to some extent and you'll see these like brown tufts on the, the top of the field and that like probably most valuable like top few inches of the hemp flower are then um, basically un un unsaleable. Let's see. We get questions. I have probably one of the most frequent questions I get is how much do you have to water uh, hemp? And um, I'll let the growers later, I think, may have, a, have an answer to this, but is one of those things that still has me scratching my head when somebody wants one answer on how much water does hemp use. That we certainly know that where you are in the world, the day length and the climate will impact how much water hemp requires. But then we don't have a standard set of production practices to follow. And uh, to my understanding of water use, that really is critically important. So here are three hemp fields, took pictures of these all at within about 10 days uh, of each other in the end of August of last year. And so left-hand side, I see a field where the plants are really pretty big. They're shoulder to shoulder, basically entirely covering the ground. I expect that like on one day in the end of August, those plants are using quite a bit of water. They've got a lot of leaf area and a lot of uh, opportunity to transpire. 
within the same week, take a picture of this field where plants have quite a bit of either bare ground or weeds in between them and they're sort of moderately sized. I expect that uses less water than the field that is um, shoulder to shoulder with hemp plants. And then in this final uh, image, you can see that they've grown probably a better crop of uh, tremulous um, puncture vine than they have of hemp. And on any one day, these three fields are gonna be using a different amount of water because they got planted on different dates. They manage soil fertility, planting space, genetic selection differently. And so the notion that someone will call me and say, how much water does a hemp plant use? It depends on the system that you're growing it in. And if you're growing really tiny plants for whatever reason, they'll use less water than if you're growing really big bushy ones. Um, and so there's work to be done both on uh, water use itself but also on standardizing production system so that you can have something to fit that water use to. Um, that said, we go out and get called out to a field because there are um, worried about root-borne insects, worried about cutworms in the field. And we do see some cutworm damage on uh, hemp in other parts of the state and see symptom like this, a really long sort of uh, drooping, drooping plants and scratch our head, go put your finger in the soil. It is like dry as dust. Um, and I would have thought that this kind of symptom would have been something that people would cue into, even if you've just like raised a potted plant on, uh, on your porch or something that wilted leaves is often a sign um, that you gotta check water. Um, but this was like a 10 acre farm and the grower just wasn't quite thinking in that way. Um, see some sort of strange looking symptoms in hemp. This uh, grower uh, called us in to look at this plants that he said looked like elephanty and uh, puzzled over herbicides in the soil and um, ended up sending in a sample for um, virus and viroid screening. And this is, uh, these are symptoms of something called a hop latent viroid, which is a seed borne uh, viroid um, that can be mechanically moved around. We don't know a lot about it. It doesn't really cause issues in hops, uh, but has shown up in uh, hemp in the past few years and not totally clear how economically important it is, but certainly like gets growers worried when they see plants looking funny. Um, let's see, uh, then get called out because of like broken branches. And this is like un directly underneath a, a plant. And you can see here that just like in three or four or cases, branches is breaking off of plants. And we like run around in circles for like months with the plant pathologist. We send these things to campus. We're trying to figure out what's going on here. They're just weak plants that they have like been bred with some objective in mind and having strong uh, branches is not that, particularly when you grow big plants at wide spacing um, can have some issues that as I drive around and see marijuana growers, they will often do some trellising of their plants to prevent this from happening. But then that's a, a sort of like cost uh, versus value uh, question. Let's see, one other uh, concern that's on folks' mind is uh, pollination. That as, um, as we said early on, that most growers are aiming to grow sort of like virgin, unpollinated female flower buds. And uh, hemp naturally is dioecious and so has male plants. And you can see a couple male plants in these, uh, these images. Um, got lots of questions about how far does pollen move, um, about what is the actual, like if we are able to thresh those seeds out of biomass, what would the CBD content be? And what is the like sort of economic proposition of having to feminize those seeds and rogue out males versus not worrying about it and losing some level of CBD production? Um, plenty of questions there, not very many answers. Um, then the other like big question that we deal with is, um, is hot hemp about the potential that you're gonna grow this hemp crop and prior to harvest at some point, it's gonna creep up above that 0.3% total THC level. And what do we do about it? And that makes that, it, um, in Oregon, if you exceed that 0.3% um, THC level in the field, that the crop, um, and you can run it through a different lab, but if it continues to test hot, there's nothing to be done but to destroy the crop. And so a lot of concern about that, a lot of discussion about is that 0.3% total THC an appropriate threshold or not. Um, so I went and asked our Department of Agriculture for this past season, how many uh, fields actually failed that test? And we end up with a pie chart that looks like this. 
And so this was data as of December 2nd of last year, um, about 1800 fields and only 7% of those fields failed that test. I don't know if I would, I think I probably would have guessed a higher number if I were guessing, but this is just one of those things we don't have a lot of data on. And my best understanding um, based on reading literature and some work that's been done at Cornell is that uh, your cannabinoid content is sort of fixed in ratio genetically and that uh, if you pick the right genetics that uh, you'll be able to achieve relatively high CBD contents while staying below that um, THC threshold. But if we can see here like the range of these things, somebody ended up with 6% uh, THC at the end of the season. That's just a question of like, you didn't select hemp seeds, you got something else. What, um, and that's why that happens and that the mean and median value are down well below um, down well below that 0.3% limit. Um, but I think there is a question of um, if absolutely maximizing uh, CBD production is the goal that I think we have like a lead, probably have a legislative limit that we could grow more CBD if you didn't have such a tight um, THC limit uh, based on how those sort of things function genetically within the plant. Um, and then in terms of harvest that we see like a whole broad range of harvest uh, strategies, lots of fields getting harvested by hand, um, lots of attempts on figuring out how to mechanize harvest. Uh, growers this past year have, um, I think had better success using these bean picker type harvesters to go through and that'll strip the, the leaves and flowers off the plant and leave the stems behind. And, um, and so that's relatively, um, relatively workable. I think the, uh, for the 2019 season, we saw lots of different kinds of harvest equipment. And we mostly saw people like working on broken harvest equipment that was gummed up or uh, non-functional because it just like wasn't quite, you can't just use a combine with a corn header to try to harvest hemp, um, even if that's the intention. And there's lots more that I can talk about in terms of challenges of drying, processing, and marketing, but I am um, seeing that I am just about out of time. And so I'm gonna stop there. And if we've got a minute for questions, we'll, we'll take them and I'll be around later. I've got more questions and there's my contact information if you'd like to reach out. Thank you, Dr. Jones. That was um, brief, but really informative. I do have some questions. You brought up some, um, and we do have a few minutes here um, before we have to move on to the farmer panel. But um, it looks like most of the fields you showed were drip irrigation. I mean, is that pretty much the standard or what kinds of irrigation strategies are these folks using? So mostly drip irrigation, that there's um, sort of like some perceived wisdom that you don't want the plants to get wet. And there's some reality about that. And I think it was the was the end of the 2019 season. We had rains relatively early in the fall and uh, botrytis or white mold is a, a real issue for hemp that those flowers are like sort of dense and sticky enough. They've been accumulating whatever like spores are floating by for the whole season. And then if they get wet and wet for a prolonged period, um, they will uh, mildew. And so since we don't have like good information on exactly how you control that botrytis or exactly what are the conditions that uh, cause it to be problematic in hemp, that people are saying, let's avoid getting the flowers wet. Um, that said, in other parts of Oregon, we see people um, irrigating with sort of center pivot irrigation. We had a variety trial at the research station. Um, we sort of played a different game in terms of production. We directly seeded it into the ground. We cultivated it with cultivation equipment and watered it overhead with, um, with like hand line irrigation system. And on some varieties, depending on when they were uh, flowering and when we were irrigating, we did see some detritus, but it wasn't across the board. Um, drip irrigation is, is mostly uh, the deal in our part of the world. There, there is hemp grown in, in places that don't require irrigation, um, but I think you run into more of those mold and mildew and pathogen problems. Mm -hmm. and, and do folks fertigate through the drip irrigation or they just give water and hope that their soil is good enough to grow a crop? Um, most, if not all, will do some level of fertigation that... Um, yeah. Okay, and also you had mentioned 
<clears throat> a seedborn a viroid. Is there any program to provide hemp certified seed that would be free of you know pathogens? Yeah, that um, there are a number of different um, land grant universities and laboratories that will do um, that will. Um, will certify seed or will at least do seed sort of testing. And which was, I, th I think early on, like in 2019, people were, uh, there was so much money in it that people were selling all sorts of like sort of suspicious and um, nefarious things as, as hemp seed. And so just the like, do you know what the like germination rate is? Do you know that this is actually feminized seed? That uh, those kind of things can now be, um, can be tested for in a lab. The issue with like viruses and um, viroids is that you have to know to look for them. And there's like viral DNA and everything. And so it's a little bit of like, is this enough of an economic problem to know that we should be looking for it or not? And it was 2019, I was hearing a bunch and out in I think three fields that we uh, found some plants which tested positive for the um, hop latent viroid. Um, this past season didn't hear about it at all. And so it's sort of hard to know like those seed sources and mother plants that are um, that that's coming from. And okay. Lots of potential problems. And it's sort of in my position, it's like, which of these things are like rising high enough in the that like need our work this year or next year, knowing that the industry is going to be different the year after that and the year after that again, how do we like sort of position research that will be expensive? It'll take a long time to do in most cases. Right, with volatile markets and <laughs> production levels. Um, one other question, you would, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the corn earworm, uh, which is a moth um, or larval form of a moth, um, there's not very many uh, insecticides registered for hemp. How are growers going about dealing with that? I know BT works quite well on corn earworm, but um, they have to ingest a certain amount first, but that uh, will stop them feeding right away. Uh, what insecticides are, or how are growers approaching pest management, like a corn earworm and also the cutworm, which is a more difficult critter? Right. So and I can't comment on every state across the country because pesticides are regulated through the state departments of agriculture. What Oregon has done is come up with a guide list of things that are not explicitly prohibited from use on hemp, that some uh, pesticide labels will be vague enough that they say like and other and other like uh, herbaceous plant material that then opens a window to say, they're not explicitly saying don't use this. And those tend to be a set of insecticides that are the like commonly known to be safe. I don't quite remember that acronym, but they're the ones that are on the like uh, OMRI organic list for the most part. And so that includes things like uh, BT. And there are a couple of strains of BT that are known to be more uh, efficacious against these corn earworms. And that's what people are using, but we don't have good economic thresholds we don't have good sense of exactly the timing or differential by variety of that I know the corn earworm is like hot on people's mind in my corner of Oregon. We don't hear so much about it in Eastern Oregon and Central Oregon, um, but people are, are spraying BT and a whole heap of other things, either um, knowing that they're gonna be effective or sort of like prophylactically because they've got what they think is what they anticipate as being a high value crop and want to protect it but we don't have the like sort of systems of integrated pest management to do that in any kind of like well-informed way right well and um i notice on the chat um there's a question about uh, certified well it's kind of difficult to get certified nop certified uh organic hemp um but um what proportion of growers are you working with that do grow what might be considered organic? Um, that's a good a good question. I think there are some I think certified organic growers, and there are lots that sort of philosophically are headed in that direction. May not be perfectly following the standards, but there's a I think a sentiment and, and maybe a reasonable one that people are 
feel like they're trying to grow something that is like kind of close to a medicine and and that it has health benefits for you and they don't want to um, are really concerned about both the real and perceived um, sort of like potential like contaminants or adulterants in uh, in the crop and so that there um, are lots of folks who are headed in that direction will use organic um, soil amendments where possible and then as I mentioned there aren't I don't think there are Maybe they're just starting to be like one or two uh, conventional um, pesticides which can be used on hemp. Um, but basically they've got a list of organically compliant materials are the only pesticides that are um, that are allowed to be used. Okay, very good. Well, um, thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Uh, really good. I'm sure we could go on <laughs> for quite a long time talking about the uh, nooks and crannies of production, but uh, we're going to move on to um, our farmer panel, and I will um, see here. Let me um, here. Akasha, let me let me go to um, my slide set first. There we go. Okay. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, a little slow on the transition there. Um, the next group of folks we're going to hear from are our farmer panel, and um, I'm going to introduce uh, all the farmers at once, and then uh, we're going to start off with Akasha. Uh, Akasha Ellis, uh, he's the co-founder and farm and operations lead of the Ventura Sea Company. Uh, he's dedicated his life to wellness and healing. Early on, he saw the power of hemp after witnessing firsthand how CBD aided his father who was gravely ill. He quickly moved on, uh, moved to pair his passion for farming and Mother Earth with helping people. His mission at Ventura Seed Company was and is to make hemp more accessible to people globally by growing in a way that helps heal our uh, planet as well as uh, our planet's people. And Associated with him is uh, Phil McGrath because uh, he farms partially on uh, McGrath family farm and uh, Phil is a fifth generation uh, farmer on his, on the Oxnard Plain in Ventura County and that is also the site of Rodale Institute's new California Organic Center. Uh, Phil has served on the Ventura County Farm Bureau Board. He's also a member of the Los Angeles Food Policy Council and was part of a group that started the Farm to School program in Ventura County and is also part of a pilot program designed to develop a local food hub. And his true passion is farm education. And for 25 years, he has conducted uh, farm tours uh, with elementary, high school, and college classes. And I would note, um, I first met Phil when <clears throat> uh, my hair was not blonde, it was brown. Um, so I've been acquainted with him for about 20 years, I think. And then uh, the last farmer panel is uh, Sander Bogdan. He has 25 years of experience in hemp, uh, cannabis, and large-scale ag production. Uh, he prioritizes organic implementation and thinks that is really important uh, from large scale cattle ranches to craft cannabis. He recently started Bogdan Agricultural Systems with his two sons, um, growing greenhouse boutique smokable hemp flour at a six acre facility in Pescadero, which is in kind of north of San Francisco, if you're looking, um, using organic practices. So um, Akasha, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you, Rex, and um, you know, thank you, Gordon, for uh, your presentation. It was informative to me, also, so I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Ventura Seed Company, we we began um, our hemp project here in January of 2018, uh, looking to actually bring hemp to California and growing it here 
uh, organically and wanting to actually partner with Phil McGrath. As you heard, he's fifth generation here and they have a, is a 300 acre farm here. We have yeah. 300 acre organic farm. Um, we've got, you know, Driscoll's Berries here. We've got a couple nonprofit uh, and, and educational centers here from so small scale to large scale. Uh, and we leased out uh, 30 acres and somehow convinced the county of Ventura with Steve Sprinkles and, and the CDFA to allow us to run a, a regenerative ag under the Regenerative Ag Nonprofit Association to, to offer him to the county. Um, and we successfully did a 30 acre grow in 2018. We, we weren't really allowed to take the product anywhere off the grounds of the farm. So we had to learn the lessons of how to dry uh, in hoops near the ocean, which I wouldn't recommend anybody to do. Um, and then once, it was, once the farm bill was passed, um, we were actually able to get our crop certified organic with USDA through a third party agency with ProCert. So, um, you know, if anybody has any questions about it, they are interested in getting their, their crop certified organic, we definitely can answer that or help you know, guide you in some direction. Um, so we, we also did genetics and seed propagation. One of the things that we, that we found was that we couldn't find reliable genetics. Um, and at the time, you know, each state was requiring that somehow those genetics were born from that state, which I don't know quite sure how that's gonna happen if the state wasn't growing hemp beforehand. But we were able to bring in genetics from Colorado that was um, being grown by other genetic, genetic companies. And we did our own seed propagation here uh, at the end of 2018 and, and then began doing genetics, taking genetics in from Oregon and from Colorado and creating our own genetics here in California. Um, when the 18, to that December 18th Farm Bill Act passed and legalized hemp, uh, we were also did a pilot program in New York in 2018. So we had a dual, a dual center doing uh, growing hemp in both locations, obviously very different types of environments and climates. Um, when we talked about drip tape being used here, you know, in New York, we didn't use any, any irrigation. We allowed Mother Earth to, to, to basically irrigate our plants. Um, and we, we kind of catapulted into 2019 and were asked to grow um, close to like 700 acres here in Ventura County. We were contracted out to grow that. Uh, most of us made it through it, um, but we did have about 60 acres that we were unable to actually find buyers for, but we had contracts for the first 600 acres. So that's something I would lead into later in this conversation with farmers. If, if they have any ideas about farming hemp, you know, make sure you can definitely find a way to an outlet for that. Um, Akasha, let me interrupt here just to, for a second. If you could put your um, PowerPoint on presentation mode, that would make the... Oh, sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> it's just, Are we on it right now? Um, we can see it, but it's in kind of edit mode. So if you go to uh, the... Um, How is that? Is that any better? If you go to the lower right, And uh, then there's this. Um, I see uh, remote control and I see more. Uh, there a small icon that looks like a screen. Yeah, and the lower right. Okay, this here. A little to the left. Uh -huh. Keep on going right there. Right there? Nope, right there. How does that work? Is that good for you guys? Hmm. Do you need to click on it? Nope, that's good. That's good. Okay. Just that's took a good. while to. Okay. All right. Um, Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Um, so I, that leads us into you know why we, maybe we can jump back to why we actually chose Ventura County um, to grow hemp here in California. And, and I, I would say ideally is it was receptive to actually having us grow. It's one of the Ideal. It's a beautiful place to, to be and grow, and it's it's an ideal climate, I think, for at least smokable hemp, um, smokable flower hemp. And in in speaking with you know finding the right community and the right uh, partners to do this with, Phil McGrath and the Ventura County were open to that. We had been searching different counties within California to grow hemp, and this was the ideal location, and they they were the most receptive to it at the time. Um, I'm going to, I'm actually going to let Phil talk for a moment and maybe discuss, you know, some of the benefits he thinks for Ventura County is with him too. Since, sure. yeah, you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, 
Welcome everybody. I thank you for, can everyone hear me all right through the mask? Ventura County is experiencing some terrible spikes right now. And if it's all right, I'd like to leave it on. And I just wanna make sure I'm still clear and everyone can hear. Okay. Um, like Akasha was saying, my family, uh, we have quite a history here. Um, we started off in the 1860s as cattle ranchers and we did that for 40 years. And then we got into dairy farming in 1910, 1920. After World War II, we started uh, with our row crop farming. And in the mid nineties, I started growing organically because that was my demand with farmer markets and the direct marketing programs I was getting into. Um, my point is that our farm, Ventura County, we have always been about change. And if there's a crop that, uh, I, I wanna boast so much about this crop. It, it does it all. It cleans the soil. It uses very little water. Um, yeah, there's pests and, and problems there, but it seems to be a, a fighter. And the uses it has, it, it's just one of the best crops. And I saw the writing on the wall. And when Akasha and I met through a mutual acquaintance, I, I was very, very curious about this crop. And I do remember my father talking about his father growing some. So I think it was grown here either early 19th uh, century or uh, before, but it's, I wanted to get on really about how, if you are considering growing it organically, this is a great crop and uh, not that Akasha hasn't had problems. He took on where, where we're growing this crop has been certified organic for 20 years. And we still had, they are called legacy pesticides in the CBDs. Uh, that's why we went from an isolate to a dissolate yeah. to get rid of some. It has this incredible quality of cleaning the soil. Uh, like everyone in California, we used DDT uh, 70 years ago, 60 years ago. And there's remnants of that in our soil. But for me, Ventura County is experiencing some of the worst drought conditions we've had in uh, weather record recording history. And we're really low on uh, summer crops. We really, there were peppers, some tomatoes. This county right now, I just drove here earlier. Uh, it, it's really about strawberries and celery right now. We, yeah, we're harvesting strawberries in January, but uh, that's when the markets are. Uh, I was infatuated by this crop in 2018. Akash and his company came here and did a research and development project here. It, it did all right, but we obviously, <laughs> had the early uh, uh oh uh, learning as we go kind of uh, problems. Um, 2019, I think we both did quite well with yields and, and having it down a little better. But then we got hit with uh, some of local politics. Basically, it was the smell, uh, the counties, the cities, all municipalities. Uh, we're up in arms. We went through a political process that was really mutually, uh, they gave a little, we gave a little. Uh, we went from a half mile buffer that was uh, through an emergency ordinance and they brought it down to a quarter mile, which is a big help. Uh, like Rex was saying, we have Rodell here, they're doing uh, research and studies and trials, and they're exempt from those buffers. That was a big deal. And then we had the economic problems. Um, oversupply. Yeah, yeah, oversupply. I think uh, 2019, 2018, I think the total numbers in America went from 75,000 acres 
to 475,000 acres in one year. And no one thought it could happen, but yeah, uh, farmers are- yeah, um, yeah, one of the biggest things we saw here with Ventura County is in 19, we did, we had 3,500 acres that we grew. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in 18, it was just maybe 30 or 60 acres total. And then 19, there were 3,500 acres. Last year, there were 200 acres. And we can go into why that, you know, why that happened. Part of it is because of the ordinance that the county put in place, but also just the demand and the, the supply and the demand side of it. Yeah. Um, you know, Bill, Bill mentioned one thing here about water. We do have a, a record here the last, you can see the last two years of the consumption that we've actually used whoops, um, for water here in the county. And I know Gordon was mentioning, you know, this is, a, we do a drip irrigation here. Um, I've worked on some farms that do a pivot and, you know, I've worked in New York where we don't use any water, no irrigation at all, just natural. So, but as you can see here uh, per acre uh, for hemp right here, you can get 0.3 uh, that we're using through the whole growth season. And then you can see the different types of crops here that we grow in Ventura County uh, and the difference you see in water usage, um, which is an interesting little fact. And I can welcome, you know, more than, Happy to share what our findings have been with that with others. Um, just it, you know, quickly going back. I mean, this is this is our company, uh, Ventura Seed Company. It's my father and brother and I. Um, obviously, my father has been an advisor. He's still with us today after using CBD and 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 uh, THC to help him with the throat cancer and not having to use any opiates or feeding tube, which was amazing. And that was over seven years ago. Um, some of the growing practices. I mean, this is on our farm here. It's actually you know, backyard for uh, Bill's backyard here. And this is our, our tractor and our people, our team putting in the seedlings. Um, you'll typically see, you know, plastic or no plastic in New York. We did no plastic and we weeded with hose and, and, and uh, manual weeding. And then here we also maintain the, the, the crops. Let me see if I can get a, uh, you know, here's our crops after they, you know, after maybe a, a month of veg. Typically the plant will grow about 12 inches per week once the, it comes out of the, a little stunt, maybe from the seedling, transplanting of the seedlings. Um, the germination is about, uh, I'm jumping around here, but the germination is probably about three to four weeks. And that way you'll help with that root bound, avoiding that root bound issue that, that Gordon was talking about when you mm -hmm. transplant the seedlings. You can also do, um, uh, you know, you can do direct seed. Also that's typically seen with, Auto flower. Um, we we tried we tried transplanting uh, auto flower genetics uh, with with seedlings, and that was a disaster. They went they got basically triggered to go right into flower. Um, so maybe you should explain what an auto flower is. Okay, I'm not sure what everyone. Yeah, okay, that's yeah. that's a good point, uh, Phil. So with feminized hemp seed, you know we we have CBD and CBG. Both of those were mentioned with Gordon earlier, um, but you have a photosensitive variety and you have an auto flower. And the auto flower is a rhodoalis. It's, it's a northern species of the plant. Um, it, it will typically flower uh, within, regardless of the, of the life duration of the, of the atmosphere with the, with the sunlight. So it's not photosensitive. So you could be at 13 hours, 14 hours, and that plant will automatically flower. And usually it's about a 75 to 85 um, day range where you'll see that plant actually flowered. Whereas Another plant, like if we, if it's photosensitive, if we plant in June, it will, it will, it will flower, it will basically veg until it'll grow until it begins to flower in late August, mid to late August. And then that cycle is usually anywhere between seven to 12 weeks, depending on that particular photosensitive genetic. Um, the auto flower, again, if you planted it in June, you would go, you direct seed it, you'd see an 80 to 80 to 90 days that plant should be at its full maturity and you would be harvesting it. It's a very funny looking plant. It's just this giant stem that comes, well, well it's different varieties. It has a little bit more yeah. plant, but it's not the same bush that you're looking at. You're not going to get the yields. Yeah, yeah it'll typically yeah. be uh, a couple ounces per plant rather than a couple pounds per plant um, that you'll see. Um, we, you did, Gordon talked about the compliance and testing. I think one of the hurdles, um, that we see as farmers, and I'm sure most of us who are growing hemp, one of the one of the issues that we've run into is, you know, they give you a harp there's a harvest window. Um, originally, we were given 30 days the first couple of years that we were growing uh, hemp. Uh, um, now we're being asked as soon as we test the plant for compliance with THC, 
um, we're given 15 days. That's the new law yeah. that's coming into effect. Um, and this was a recommendation given uh, through the USDA. Um, and now many of the states are adopting that. Now, I, I've, I can tell you as a farmer in, in trying to harvest with issues of labor, you know, issues with uh, weather. I mean, we've, we've had, typically we have the Santa Ana winds that come in in late September, early October, we get 78, 80 mile an hour winds. It's very difficult to be harvesting, you know, uh, plants when you've got that kind of, that kind of wind gust happening. So I think there needs to be a more realistic idea of, of when, you know, the time window that farmers have to actually harvest their, harvest their plants for hemp. Um, so that, those are some of the idiosyncrasies that this particular crop has. Well, you know, and, and to be clear, that is just Ventura County. This, I, I can't say that's true for Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo. We went through our own political process last year of what the, the neighbors want. They want the crop in and out as quick as possible. That's why they went from 30 days to 15 days. But there is some leeway with weather if there is a rain or a storm. But no, it was 3,400 acres, 3,600 acres in 2019. And yeah, it smelled. Uh, we had a lot of rain that year. Well, we had actually a substantial amount of rain considering the previous 12 years were drought years. Uh, but it made it harder for some farmers to get in and just the crop down. So the smell lingered. Uh, we had communities up in arms. Um, luckily, uh, I want to say level heads prevailed and we just got uh, the ordinance completely redone about two, three weeks ago. And there is more uh, adjustments for growing the crop in the county. Yeah, we, we can, we have, now there's a setback only for a quarter mile within a sensitive area for like a school or a park or a church and uh, a resident. But the, the issue of harvesting window is still, it's being brought down to that 15 day harvest yeah, window, yeah. which uh, hopefully the USDA will revise and, and give, because I know some states have maintained like Oregon, I, I think Gordon could answer that, but have maintained still allowing people to harvest for 30 days, uh, which was our original. And even some states are moving back to even, you know, using the Delta nine as they're testing, not total THC. So, you know, I think these, these measures, some of the biggest risks we face, and, and those are costs that farmers have to deal with. A lot of that compliance obviously starts with, you know, are the genetics, first of all, hemp, which is key. And then, you know, are you, you know, how, as, as Gordon had mentioned, you know, the, t the THC level will rise as the mature, as the plant matures, and it's in that ratio of CBD to THC. Right. So, you know, when you start getting in the thresholds of eight to 12% CBD, you're typically going to be seeing the THC rise, and it might go from 0.2 or 0.15 you know, up to 0 0.3, 0 0.35, and, then you're, taking the risk. and you're taking the risk. Yeah. And that is something that's, you know, and that harvest window also makes that risk harder for farmers. Um, Asha, could you explain a little bit, I'm sorry for the interruption, about sure. Delta 9, you made a reference to that, but. Um, yeah, so, so it's funny, the federal, on the federal level um, in 2018, we were, the, the federal level was, it was based on Delta 9. And, and Delta 9 is the psychoactive component you find in THC that gets you to feel psychoactively high. Um, the THCA, THC, the total THCA or total THC includes Delta 9 and THCA. And THCA is a non-psychoactive until it is decarboxylated, until it is heated up. And then it transfers over to what we consider to be Delta 9. So if you heat up uh, THCA at some, I don't know what the threshold, I can't speak for science on that side, but when you heat it up to a certain level, or you do a test on it, and that's how the lab report tests are done, it converts over to THC, Delta 9. So they use that as a measurement. Typically, the plant will have, you know, like point, at least our genetics will have, you know, anywhere between 0.05 of Delta 9, non-detect Delta 9, or 0.05, 0 0.1, and then the, the remaining balance would be THCA. So if you've got 0 0.2, 0 0.23, 0.3 THCA, and you add that just that little bit of delta nine, you go over the threshold potentially to 0.4 or whatever. Um, and and the states were not required initially, you know, with the testing, it wasn't that wasn't a requirement 
um, of states that have to uphold with it. It was only Delta nine. And then they switched over to total THC. I think the, there's been recently a, um, Rand Paul out of Kentucky and some other congressmen are now actually trying to raise that limit to 1%, which would really take this stress out of farmers and the risk that they have of losing their crop. Because you can grow, there's plenty of healthy, great genetics out there that are under 1% for sure. Yeah. So, um, and, and just in regards, I think also, I, I don't know about the timing here, you could give me the tell me when to stop, Rex, but, um, you know, I think there were some questions, I think maybe people have questions about how the spacing would be um, with the plants when you're planting. Um, you know, typically, you know, that's going to be based on, and also the genetics. So your genetics, if you've got a freeze, your, if your last freeze is like June, you know, and your next and your first freeze is like early September, you're looking at like a, having to use an auto flower, you know, so you really want to be careful about what genetic you're buying. Um, and then, of course, if you've got uh, a, a full season, I would consider like for us, we don't really freeze here at all. So we could be planting, you know, in May or June um, or even July, and then we would be harvesting into September, early October. Um, now, again, so those are photos. You could typically use a photosynth if you get a higher yield per plant. Um, it's not as precarious. It's 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 an easier plant to work with once it's been you know a photosensitive plant. However, you know the autoflower gives you the, the the exact time more of exact time that you want to actually harvest. Yeah. So some farmers may may actually yeah. you know want to have that as their as their basis. But for higher yields, definitely and, and higher CBD, you're typically going to go with a photosensitive plant. Um, we plant typically here in early July, um, the last three years, and you know for us we harvest beginning of September through the end of, I'd say middle October. So, um, you know, for us, our plants are already in that, in that, just, just in that veg period of like a month, our plants are, uh, you know, close to six feet, six feet on average. That's a manageable plant to harvest. Um, and mechanically, you're probably going to want to harvest plants a little bit smaller than that. Uh, if you're going to do it hand harvest, you're also going to want to be in that range. If you're doing, you know, larger acreage, if you're doing one or two acres, you can harvest big, big mama plants if you want. Um, the, but the, the spacing that we typically do is between 36 and 48 for ourselves here when we're, when we're planting in that first, second week of July. Um, and then for, B, like you mentioned something about BT, we have used BT uh, pre in the previous years. Um, this year, we in 2020, we did not use it, and we did see uh, we had a pretty big problem with the um, corny with the corny worms. Um, Cucumber beetle. Yeah, yeah, I mean they, they were there, and I I think you know we would probably want to do an aerial spray of BT if if we could. It's under Omri, um, so it would be allowed. Um, but that's how we would that's how we would do is be an aerial spray in in probably a probably about a week or two. Uh, in, in early August, so you don't want to be spraying when the when the flower is already pretty dominant coming out with the pistols. You don't want that to happen with your just to avoid botrytis and other issues. And I think there have been. I think the industry is catching up. There are more products for him as opposed to 2018. I think there's certain. Yeah, I, have, I, I haven't read any yet myself, but um, well, I know they're talking about it. Yeah, yeah I, they're. I know the industry is trying to catch up. Yeah. yeah. Um, just a, just we, a quick interruption here about the OMRI, that's Organic Materials Review Institute right. for folks that aren't acquainted with that. And there are BT, BT is a um, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a formulation of bacteria that is toxic to, uh, the spores are toxic to a wide range of um, moths and um, butterfly larvae. Uh, there are, however, formulations of BT that are OMRI registered, mean, meaning they're okay for use in uh, organic production systems. And then there are some that are not OMRI listed because of par part of the manufacturing process. And I would note, because these are moths, the adult form are moths that if you put up some bat boxes, 
that will suppress the populations because they fly at night. These moths fly at night. The only predators around at night are bats that would feed on these guys. And so that would be, it's not a miracle cure, but if you support a diverse population of predators, you'll have uh, fewer problems. So just a quick interruption there. No, that's a great, that, that, that's really helpful. I mean, we might, we might try that. Yeah. I mean, we did the biologics in our greenhouse. Um, I'm gonna let Sandor talk more on the greenhouses since I know he's doing a lot of that, but that's something we do, you know, and, and administer the biologics to help with the pest control. I think the first year you had some late swimming. And we had wasps, predatory wasps, yeah. things of that nature too. Um, Good point. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Let me, We've got, uh, I mean, all the things that you mentioned um, for the pests, you see thrips, caterpillars, leaf miner, aphids. We, we see all of these issues. Um, typically in the, in the nursery, there's more thrips and leaf miner and powdery mildew, uh, not as much out in the field. Um, I think a big issue is, is weeding. I think that's a big cost that most farmers should really take into account. Um, I, I, you know, Gordon really talked about we do use a plastic mulch. We've also done small areas where we haven't used plastic mulch and we're doing you know, tests with uh, Rodale uh, to, to further this to see you know, kind of what the difference in cost would be and how we can actually uh, even like talks of no-till versus till, um, those kind of little small research plots we're gonna be doing. We're even doing, a re we did a soil remediation. We had one little section where we know there was a higher count of cadmium and we planted um, hemp there the last three years, but they did a soil test prior to us uh, planting in, uh, in 2020. So we're getting the test back for 2020 after we actually harvested and, and took another soil test. I'll let Rodale be the ones that come out with that data. Um, and then in, another big factor could be male coaling. I mean, most, if you've never grown hemp, you definitely um, should get your understanding of what a male plant looks like. I mean, that was again mentioned in Gordon's slides. Um, the, the seed, from my experience, when you when we grow genetics and we have a flower that is full of, of uh, seeds um, and we get it tested, it's usually about, let's say it would be 10 to 12% in CBD and the top flower. Whereas if we were having no seeds, it would be in the 15 to 16%. Now I don't have science to, to back this up. That's just from my own lab results of me taking flour from the field with no seeds and flour from, you know, with seeds from within the uh, nursery where we're actually propagating the seeds. Um, let's see here, harvest methods. I mean, we've tried every method you can imagine. I mentioned the first year we did a, a hand harvest under hoops, um, but we had a, you know, we live near the ocean. So we have a marine layer that comes in every night. And you know the plant would get dry to 11%, yeah. and then all of a sudden it, moisture, <laughs> the moisture yeah. would be sucked back yeah. up, and we'd come back in the morning. It'd be at 14, 15%. So it took us like three months. We had to build these containers, put dryers, dehumidifiers, racks in there. Uh, in the rain, it was it, it was uh, the hardest work we've ever done. Um, well, on that note, you also tried the mechanical harvesting. Yeah. And, 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 so until yeah. 2019, we did. We we had the, the baler. Uh, the Oracle baler, um, we brought in a cloth baler for the 700 acres because we only had two weeks to harvest everything here. So a lot of that was taken for biomass. Um, the other 60 acres we did more for biomass and flour and that was hand harvested. Um, uh, the bales were, they're a monster task in itself. Um, you, you really need to make sure. My suggestion, if you're, you know, you're going for biomass, if there's a way that you can you know, uh, basically harvest it and lay it in the field and then use a combine. That would be, I would think your cheapest method of actually doing it for biomass. You know, hand harvest for biomass in the future is over. Uh, the price per the pound is just too low. Um, it's a byproduct maybe for us if we're growing smokable flour. So it's easy just to, to take that and sell that as a separate byproduct for oil. Um, we also did, uh, believe it or not, silage baling in New York because um, we, we couldn't, we had a and invested in a stripper head uh, from Shelburne where it would go and just strip the flower off of the plant, but our plants were too big. So it broke all the teeth in New York. So we had used a forager, you know, a corn harvester to, uh, to actually take down and took most of the plant that lowers your CBD. Um, we've used raised drying floors. You know, we, we dried about a million pounds in New York. Um, it was, it was a crazy storm, to be honest with you. Um, 
please be careful you know, with the type of drying equipment you're going to use. Um, feel free to reach out to me and ask me, but uh, you know, I think if there's ways that you can do this economically without having to, to dry, uh, if you can dry in the field, you're gonna, especially for, for biomass, you're gonna save yourself a lot of money. Um, we typically, the list 2020, we did a hand harvest, but it was all grown for smokable flour. So um, as you can see here, this is, one, this is our warehouse on the left where we're hanging the plants. This is old style. We literally have scissor lips and we hang, this is all flour that's gonna be hung dry. Um, on the right, you'll also see another shot in, in our warehouse. Um, a lot of people also use racking systems for hanging for smokable flour. Um, this is us cutting the plants to get them ready to be brought into the warehouse. Um, and then here's one of our greenhouse shots of also flower being, I think this was actually a seed, uh, us drying for seed, seed propagation. And um, I think you know, this, is a, this is one of our harvest towards our har end, of, end of season, uh, early October, late September before we were going to harvest. Um, most of the plants you will see, there is a lot of phenos within the genetics still in hemp. Um, you've got different sizes here. Um, we were growing uh, five different strains, but they were, you know, um, segregated each of those strains. Some were flowering a little bit earlier than others, and we, we, we planted them on purpose so that we could stagger our harvest. Um, I think the call of action for legislature, we, we mentioned earlier, you know, what makes this a feasible crop? Um, you know, I think it's really important that we figure out this harvest window and we figure out the total THC and raise that limit. Um, and then, you know, it, it, this plant, as, as Phil said, it's just got, it's so remarkable. I mean, it provides us food, it provides us medicine, it provides us fiber and plastic. And, and uh, I mean, in 19, we donated a few tons of, of, um, of, of the stock to be made into homes, to hemp home and hemp insulation for some nonprofits here in Ojai. There's just so many uses and, and we know that it sequesters so much carbon, um, you know, helping farmers to even subsidize and put, I think, you know, hemp into their, as cover crops or as, as a rotational crop. Right. It would just be an amazing thing we could help this, you know, help the environment with. But I'm gonna leave it at there if there's any questions. I think we went over. Yeah, uh, I think we covered our end. You want to let Sandor come on? Yes, yeah. yes, please um, stop your share and then Sandor can um, start his share. And then um, and then I think we'll hold questions for after Sandor's presentation and then we'll have plenty of time for <clears throat> questions um, from ourselves and from the audience as well, so. Okay, well, that's a tough act to follow, and that was a lot of information. So we'll, I'll take a moment <laughs> here to kind of digest all that. Um, my name is Shondor Bogdan, and I own Bogdan Agricultural Systems. We are a boutique greenhouse producer. Um, right now, we're just working in the EU market. I mean, also opens us up to the U.S. market, but there's so much, you know. When I'm up against guys like Akasha and Phil, it's like there's a lot of competition out there. So on a boutique type small mm -hmm. level, you know, we felt that getting into Europe, you know, was a, would, have been, would help with sales a little bit, which still remains to be seen because uh, shipping to Europe is proven quite difficult. Um, you just move this thing. So a little bit about us. Um, we, we've been kind of scouring up and down the coast, um, south of San Francisco, San Mateo County, and uh, we kind of ran into the cut flower industry, which was dwindling and dying as it was. And then COVID hit and there's no more funerals. There's no more weddings. There's no more cut flower industry whatsoever. So we've run into, you know, quite a bit of greenhouse space that's just been fallow for the last two or three years. So, you know, I'm kind of old fashioned, you know, so you see a lot of smokable flower growers that want to grow in containers and you know they try especially in this boutique market and they really are just grow you know as gordon said before they're really just growing the same way as you know inefficient ways just like cannabis i mean their overhead is through the roof they're trellising they you know it's just painful painful to watch so we luckily enough found uh six acres of greenhouse that had 
soil floors. So, you know, no containers, which, you know, I was elated about that. You know, it gives us the ability to build the soil. I mean, we're definitely behind the ball, as I said, because we were, we we're thrown into cut flower greenhouses, which, yeah, I mean, they really, you know, they have not been doing a good job. You know, they've just been pumping flowers out and there's really been no regard. And, you know, as I go into the chemical sheds of, you know, the fertilizer sheds of what they have, it's, whoa, I mean, there's skull and crossbone warnings on a lot of the products that they've used in the past. So, and it's offered us a decent opportunity to try and, you know, start moving some facilities in the right direction. I mean, the owners are kind of kicking their feet and screaming a little bit about it. Oh, I've been hearing about organic production for 20 years. And I said, well, you know, that, that's why you are where you are right now with empty greenhouses. So, you know, we're going to, we'll, we're determined to turn this place organic in the next three years, whether you like it or not. And I'm pretty certain you're going to thank me, you know, by the end of it. Um, a little bit about me, um, 20, you know, I've kind of got thrown into cannabis at 19 years old, which was a long time ago, and uh, kind of got thrown into a scale that was pretty uncomfortable at that time in the early 90s. So it was definitely a uh, grow or die type of situation. I obtained a lot of information doing that, a lot of what's right and what's wrong. And, uh, moved into large scale cattle operations and large scale farming for 10 years of my life in Eastern Oregon. I was running 80,000 acre ranches, you know, pretty much by myself in my late 20s. So, you know, with the, with the cannabis experience and this large scale agriculture experience, you know, I feel like, you know, I, I have a pretty good handle on trying to jump into the hemp market because it is moving towards large scale, but at the same time, you still need to be able to make a decent smokable boutique product. And as I said earlier, you know, we, we're, we're growing CBG flour um, to just to be able to get into the EU market. Uh, there are some difficulties in CBG flour. It's not as new as the, C, as the, as the CBD strains that um, most other people are, or excuse me, it's newer than most of the CBD strains that most people are growing. So our genetics are a little bit behind. We find that, you know, when you see pounds of CBD flour, they're only yay big. And then you see pounds of CBG flour and they're twice the size. Uh, the, the flour is incredibly delicate. Uh, you know, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't have the genetics underneath it. I mean, it, it, it takes a special grower to, you know, foresee these corn earworms and foresee all these problems. Cause I mean, it was, I mean, this summer with, with the CBG strain we did, it was just one problem after the other. And if you were, not able to see it first and, and wait for it to react to like the problem that you, you were going to find yourself in a lot of trouble with it. Um, you know, as these guys, as, as, as the guys before me have been saying, you know, uh, soil remediation is a big deal. And, and we're finding that out as we go through with the cut flower greenhouses that we're in. Uh, it has cleaned the soil and, and much like Phil and Akasha said, we had a couple ranges that we did some soil testing before we grew. And I, you know, I, I told the owner, I said, well, I don't know, you know, this is, this is a roll of the dice. I, you know, I don't know if we're even going to pass tests by the end of it. And uh, we did pass tests and I'm, I have our soil, soil test coming out right now, but I mean, I, I think that, you know, we, we're definitely on the right track of, of helping uh, people and helping, helping the soil get cleaner. Production costs is, you know, as everyone said, that it's, you know, it's hand drying and harvesting, as you can see in the picture, and, and also like Phil and Akasha showed, I mean, hand harvesting is, it's almost a labor of love. I mean, you just, it is what it is. It's very labor intensive. The whole two weeks thing that they've now thrown it also in San Mateo County, we also have the two weeks that's been implemented on us. I mean, I, you know, that's, we're only doing six acres of greenhouse, which is about like 30,000 plants. So I couldn't imagine how, you know, on Phil and Nakasha's level, how two weeks is even going to be even feasible for you guys to do that. I mean, that just sounds like, I mean, I, I barely made it through, uh, I, I barely made it in, two, in a month on six acres, you know, because and ideally we would like to harvest in sections of the plant too, if possible, and you know, take the tops and then let the bottoms and the middles have a little bit more time. And, you know, it just kind of gives you a little more money in the end. Um, you know, and as I said, drying is, you know, 
I, I, I've consulted for a lot of guys that have called me and said, we got 300 acres. And I said, that's nice. And they said, well, now what do we do? And, you know, as those guys, as Phil and Akasha once said again, well, you're going to have to build some hoop houses and throw some dehues in there and good luck with that. I mean, your overhead is going to be through the roof. So, I mean, I would highly suggest that before you get into even contemplate getting into this, you, your drying facility is probably the most important thing that you have um, to me. I mean, cause there's nothing worse than be sitting there with three weeks to go saying, where are we going to drive this? Calling your neighbors, asking for barns, asking for this. I mean, it's just, it's just not a position to, so I, I would suggest to start backwards and start with your drying facilities and work your way backwards because growing the plant is, it's a pretty easy plant to grow. I mean, there are some issues with it, but it's a fairly easy plant to grow. Um, harvesting and curing is another, you know, it's another labor intensive process. I mean, every, in the spokable flower industry, as you can see with our picture there, every flower has to be snipped off the, off the stalk. And that's before you trim. Um, you know, that is labor intensive. I mean, I couldn't imagine what, you know, guys were doing a couple hundred acres are going through to do that. Just on my six acre level, I've had, I mean, I, I still have people going and they're not getting done. I mean, it's, you know, to get it all down off the stock and get it in the boxes before you even get to the trim, trimming process is labor intensive, very expensive, and it's a pretty slow and arduous process. Um, trimming is a whole nother issue that we are all coming up against. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of people that have jumped from the cannabis industry to the hemp industry, and they have very unrealistic expectations of what we're able to do on the scale to get a product of what they're used to seeing of a small boutique cannabis grow when we're talking acres and, you know, tens of thousands or millions of pounds in some cases and trying to get it trimmed to their exact expectations is proving a little bit difficult right now. I, I think that's one of the major, and especially in the smokable flower industry, I mean, I, that, that's one of the major things that there has to be some sort of give. Uh, you know, I've, I've used machine trim and I, I've run it through the machine once and there was a significant amount of loss and then the buyers weren't satisfied with that. So then I would run it through the machine two or three more times. And then all of a sudden I had 60, percent loss in my flower crop. And I ended up with bags and bags and bags of biomass or cigarette material or however you want to look at it. You know, and it, So if you're now taking the smokable flower and gone into biomass, you've gone from a product that could be anywhere from $100 to $200 a pound down to something that's $10 to $5 a pound. So, you know, as, as we got into this uh, smokable flower thing, you know, my sons and I, our question was, who's really our end user? You know, there's plenty of cannabis in California. And, but then we realized that, you know, there's hemp, the hemp flower is a very nice, happy medium in between cigarettes and cannabis. I mean, cigarettes obviously have the, the health issues that come along with it. And cannabis, like it or not, it's definitely kind of pretty rough on your brain to be smoking that many cannabis cigarettes a day. So hemp cigarettes seem to be a happy medium for people that are trying to wean off of cigarettes or not, you know, and then it's a pretty social, you know, is social smoking or even just normal smoking. I mean, I think it's the best of both worlds as far as that goes for, for, uh, you know, hemp cigarettes. Uh, future industry concerns. Well, you know, as, as they said, the, the processing is not really there. Um, the sales and having contracts with buyers is, I mean, that's a very important thing. There's many, many guys, and I'm sure, you know, all the other farmers can attest to this. I mean, we've seen lots of people that they have a contract and they don't have a contract and they're growing without a contract and they're stuck with this barn and material at the end. Uh, do they have enough money to process it all? Or are they just going to let it hang? How long can you let it hang before it starts to decarboxylize? So there's, you know, there's a lot of things like that. I mean, I would, I would tell most people, you know, if you're going to try and get into this industry, don't overreach, start small the first year, um, try and find your buyers, try and build work with your buyers, try and form a relationship with your buyers. Because, uh, you know, as for right now, to just blast a couple acres, 
blast a couple acres of hemp and then be sitting there on the open market with it is, I mean, unless you're well financially funded, it's not a real great place to be. I, it, it, I mean, it'll all sell at some point, but you definitely have to have a, and you have to be willing to sit there for a couple months with your product. Um, FDA regulations can, uh, concerning food additives is one of the bit, most pivotal points of the industry. I, I mean, if that, if that comes through for us, uh, you know, and it can go into drinks and shakes and smoothies and energy drinks and all these things, I mean, then we're going to really see consumer demand go through the roof. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe Akasha and Phil know. I'm not quite sure where we're at on that right now. I hear, you know, that comes to the forefront and it seems like we're ready to do it and then they pull back on us and then they're ready to do it and then they pull back on us. So, uh, you know, to me, that's that's really the biggest driver in this industry right now is if, you know, when we can go into foods. Uh, I think let's just open it up to questions at this point, you guys. I mean, after going after Gordon and... Uh, Bill and Akasha, I feel like we've pretty much covered most of the most of the basis on everything. So I think questions, Rex, if you're okay with that, would probably be the way to go now. Great, yeah. Thank you for that, uh, Sandor. And uh, yeah, I think we'll open it up to questions. And I have several, and there's a bunch uh, that Ann forwarded to me from uh, the panel as well. And you know, um, the financing is is kind of a big deal, and I think. Um, I would pose this question to all of you and including um, Dr. Jones too, as um, are, are banks willing to finance these operations and what kind of hoops do you have to jump through to get financing? Why don't we start with you, Sandor, because you were most recently. Um, well, what I've seen is they're starting to be, but the amount of cat, I mean, they're, 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 they want you to put your farm up against it, or they want, you know, they want to have some big form of capital um, to, to give you the loan. So it's only, from what I've gone with the little bit I've worked through hemp financing is that you almost need to have the amount of money that you're asking for to be able to do it anyway. So you may as well just put up your own money and, and just do it. Um, so, I mean, that's what I found so far. I mean, I, I, I don't know that the, I, I think the USDA is starting to come out with some loans here slowly. And, and that might be a little bit different than, you know, what, what is offered right now. But I, I haven't, I don't know, I can't speak for everyone, but I haven't really seen any type of financing that I've wanted to dive into. Well, and you sent a kind of follow on is even using banks. I mean, will banks accept like hemp money? I know cannabis uh, money is very debatable. Um, do, que do banks question hemp growers about like, okay, this is hemp money, like we have to be careful with this? I, I, I found that a little bit. I feel like that that's changing quickly. And, you know, now that it's a USDA accredited crop, they don't really have much choice but to accept the hemp money. I, I definitely, in 2019, it was certainly more than 2018, I'm sure. But I, as from what I've seen this year, it's, you know, I, there's starting to be a lot it's starting to open up a little bit. Akasha, you had something to say. Yeah, no, I was, I'm going to agree with Sandor. I mean, 19, we, we were able to, um, Bank of the West was, was the first bank really to support us here in, in, in Southern California to do, to do hemp financing. Before that, it was, you know, we, it, before that, it was very difficult. If, if a company or bank found out that you were, you know, doing operations with hemp, they would shut your bank account down. Um, we haven't had an issue since we've been with Bank of the West. Um, you know, I know that some merchant banks now for online sales and things, they're still, they, they, they require to how you, what you write, what claims you make, both from an FDA standpoint, but also just making sure that it's not related to cannabis or THC in any way, um, even for online, you know, type of merchant processing too. Um, but we haven't been able to get a loan, like Sandor said, that was something that we wanted to, you know, basically you have to put your house up or your land or your property to, to match the loan. And it's like, okay, well, what happens if I've got, I've shown this much revenue last year? I think, you know, in another year or so, if you've been doing operations for two or three years, most of the banks will begin to lighten those rules and maybe give some, some financing and for on interest based financing. Yeah, I'd like to bring uh, Dr. Jones. Do you, what do you, have you run across this problem with your, the farmers you work with? I think I would just echo, um, echo what the other folks have said that um, this was 
more of a problem in 2019 in terms of just like, where do I actually like put this money, um, this uh, income that you're making? And I think that, that there are certain banks in Oregon that play more nicely with um, hemp operations than, than others. And in terms of loans and financing, I'm not aware of much. My sense is that most of the growers who are growing are not taking out, um, are not financing sort of capital to do that. I know I've been asked questions of like, can you help me come up with the budget to give to my investors and like predict revenue? And it's like, well, like what month of the year do you want me to predict revenue on? What crop are you going to grow? How much of it? And that uh, I think if I were in the position of a bank, I might be with how dynamic the regulations are and the markets, I would probably be leery to, to, um, to easily give uh, loan out a bunch of money because things could change quickly and be left holding the ball. Right. And there was a comment from uh, one of the participants about uh, the USDA has now a $10 million program uh, to help with the hemp production chain. And um, we posted that, I think, and posted a, a website that can be accessed uh, for that, which is, um, I don't know if that's open to farmers or to uh, like institutions that are helping farmers. But uh, any and all help is, is probably uh, needed and necessary to get this market off the ground. I'm kind of wondering, you know, a farm service agency does um, loans and they're kind of the lender of last resort. If you've been refused by two or three commercial banks, um, has anybody had any experience with going to FSA, the farm service agency for a mm -hmm. loan? nobody's i've talked with our local office and i don't um last i spoke with them they didn't have like actual federal rules of how do we deal with hemp growers it is federally legal but just in terms of like an operating procedure they didn't have right. that so they were talking with growers but not engaging with them in their programs right i'm guessing they'd be pretty shy about doing any of that especially with a volatile market such as it is, because these are federally guaranteed loans. Akasha, were you going to say something? Uh, yeah, I would. There is, you know, with COVID, there is um, obviously with the PPP, um, hemp was allowed to be under that for grant mm -hmm. um, for PPP. And also, you can get an SBA loan with the EIDL. Um, so that was accepted, um, you know, in the last six months with, with, this whole COVID epidemic and pandemic. So um, that is available to hemp farmers. And we, we've had, you know, we, we did have success with PPP last year. So and I think they're doing a second round. So that is something you can use to help. Obviously it goes towards payroll and that's great because it covers your employees. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I have some other questions that um, kind of I wrote down um, as we were going along and clearly, it's a young market. There's all kinds of um, information needed. Um, what would you all consider the biggest obstacle or obstacles to growing hemp as a profitable crop? So like, what are the biggest challenges in, in your neighborhood? And um, why don't we start with Akasha and then we can go to Sandor and, and Dr. Jones. Yeah, thank you, Rex. I think Sandor really hit, you know, he hit the nail. Um, and it's, it's the regulations and, and, and both from an FDA standpoint, you know, with getting, allowing basically, and it, we, we were told in, in 18 and early 19 that, you know, the FDA would get behind, you know, allowing him to either be suggested dosage or a nutraceutical. And without that, the big brands are unwilling to jump in. So you've got a, a basically a, a very low demand with uh, an over oversupply of product that happened in 19. And that's still being, um, processed out even to this day, um, even though people grew again in 2020. And then you have, you know, the other hurdle, um, I think that would open up the market for customers and, you know, and being able to get contract grows. And, you know, then you've got also just the regulatory side of it where you've got like the state of California now with this new AB 245 uh, bill that's, that I think it's what it's called. Um, you know, they're, they're thinking of banning smokable hemp flour. And that's really the only, you know, viable source of income right now for hemp flour, um, you know, in this in this industry. So if they ban that, you're pretty much going to 
destroy whatever still is happening here in California if you take out the hemp, the hemp smokable flower market. And I think, you know, Sandor was really, it was the way he described, you know, I think the, the, the desire for this flower and verse, you know, smoking cannabis or smoking cigarettes and nicotine. I mean, it does fit a non-addictive kind of social accepted uh, healthy way of, of relaxing. I mean, yes, there are going to be some uh, negatives that come from smoking anything, but I think, you know, from by and large that, that we, the, the negative qualities of it are, are, yeah. are, are very low. It's not tobacco, it's not marijuana. It's, yeah. Right, and you're, not, you're, gonna, you're gonna be able to remember your name after you smoke it. <laughs> but the, 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 I think the question, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, I think there's a lobby group that's trying to push down the hemp smokable flour. So that regulatory side of it, and just, and also the USDA with the, with the THC limit of 0.3 and, and, the, and the total harvest time of, of 15 days. I mean, it's just, these aren't, these aren't things you put on other ag crops. It's already hard enough to farm as it is. So opening up those two, you know, FDA and the USDA, you know, coming up with more risk adverse. And, and then I think the contracts would open up and allow sales to happen because without a contract going forward, I mean, Sandor said it, you, you, I would not jump in this game. When we jumped in it, we were first osmosis. You know, we were able to survive and get through 19, but I tell you, it's been brutal. And I know so many friends and other farmers that have really had difficult times, including ourselves. So, you know, get the contract, but without, without certainty from regulation standpoint, I mean, who's going to jump in this, you know, even yeah. for the consumer yeah. brand? Well, Good on points. this thing, though, I just wanted to bring up, it, it, this isn't something that all of a sudden is a brand new crop. Our biggest competitors are Canada and China. And like everything we grow in Ventura County, our biggest competitors are South America or Mexico. So just dealing with international competition. Uh, yeah, we're gonna lose that. We're gonna lose yeah. the traction yeah. that we have. You've got you know, countries like Thailand just raising their limit to 1% for hemp and going and making the whole, and cannabis legal. I mean, Europe's raising their limit to 0.3, at least it's with the yeah. EU. So, and you've got Switzerland at 1%. I mean, it's just, we've got to have clear competitive advantages in America to be competitive. And it's got to stay, it's got to start on a, on a, on a you know, federal level. And then it's got to be basically implemented on a state level for us to be competitive and successful. I mean, right now, Oregon has a compet, I mean, Gordon, you, you will have a competitive advantage over California. And it's very smart of Oregon to allow, you know, to, to keep the 30 day harvest window and to test, I believe only on Delta nine now, not on total THC, if I'm correct. You have to, you could tell me if I'm wrong or not, but. Um, the, um, this past season, 2020, we switched to total THC, but certainly did have an advantage the year prior when we were just looking at Delta nine. Yeah. And you have a 30 day harvest window still? 28 days, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, make it easy, make it, make this easier on farmers. Don't make this harder and, you know, have clarity <laughs> within the state. Yeah. So I'm going to leave it yeah. to Sandor now. Yeah. Sandor, what do you have to add? I mean, as you know, as they said, when, if we're talking about international competition, I mean, it's just the same as, you know, Phil was saying with any agricultural crop, I mean, you know, we have to pay $15 an hour for labor while everybody else is paying two or $3 an hour. So, I mean, we just get, you know, I mean, I, every agricultural crop is in the, in California is pretty much, you know, that's the way it is right now. So, you know, I mean, even if you look at the tomato market, I mean, you know, heirloom tomatoes, organic heirloom tomatoes go for six, five, six dollars a pound at the store. But we couldn't afford to grow them here because they can grow them in Mexico for a dollar an hour labor. So, you know, that's kind of where, you know, we're moving quickly towards that. Um, you know, and on, on a large scale, you know, the Ukraine's opening up and, you know, a lot of Eastern Euro European companies are not, or countries are now opening up to it. So, I mean, that's only going to put more and more pressure on us. So it, we are definitely at a crossroads here where they opened up this great new industry for us and now they're putting the clamps on us and, you know, it's kind of, you almost just have to kind of sit here and just pay attention to what happens and kind of go with it as it happens. Because I oh, mean, it sounds as like, far as like a clear direction goes. Yeah. Uh, well, um, it sounds like just to paraphrase what I've heard from you guys, it's um, consistent regulatory mechanisms across 
states as well, you know, at a national level uh, would be very helpful and not to make things harder for farmers. I mean, farming is hard enough as it is. Um, so that, um, so I have a question about, um, is, is, do you feel there's enough uh, processing facilities uh, for the products you're producing or do you process your own or what would, what's the situation about processing? And uh, why don't we start with you, Sandra? I can speak for Akasha. Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I, I process my own right now. Um, you know, there aren't, I mean, somebody could probably make a fortune if they were to open up a smokable hemp flower processing facility that we actually all trusted and thought that we were going to get a good majority of our product back. Because, I mean, right now, I mean, I've, I have horror stories of sending it out and I waited on the way out and I waited on the way back in and, oh, there's only 22% of my flower here. Where the rest of, oh, well, you know, it's a lot of loss. And so, you know, there's a lot, that's not, I don't, I can't speak for everybody, but you know, that's, I'm not sending my flower out. I'm, I'm definitely going to do it myself. Um, you know, I know Akasha and Phil, I mean, as far as I know, you guys started your own lab, no? I, just, I mean, that was kind of, that's kind of something that, you know, you, even that, I mean, it's a long process to ship your material out and hope for a tolling rate that's going to be good for you. And then, you know, unless you're going to literally have somebody go every step of the way with your material and make sure that, you know, everything's on the up and up, you're definitely leaving a lot to chance, which, you know, on the, uh, with our margins, we can't leave things to chance. No, we, we're in the same boat, Sam. Yeah. I mean, we, we tried to, we had some stuff processed. We got locked into some contracts. We lost our tail with these contracts. And, you know, we, we sent the first 30,000 pounds to be, um, you know, to be made into distillate. We found a little bit of metal in there, you know, from the original acre yeah. too that we didn't know about. So then we took it to isolate. Contract was read that we had to give a certain amount per, you know, a payout to the, to the processor, a certain amount per kilo. And the price had dropped so much that by the time we just asked for our product back, we got like 20% back, but you know, we spent, we took all the risk and spent all the money and the processor kept the rest. So yeah, we've had some ugly, um, you know, experiences with that. Uh, we did end up trying to create our own. We, we kind of partnered with a friend of mine here who's done extraction before. So we've done a, a small level of extraction on our, on our, for our own distillate. Um, and we know it's clean. I mean, it, it, we also grow organically. So it's certified organic, trying to find a, an organic pro, an or, organic certified process or two is difficult. Um, and like you said, Sandor, having, knowing that even on a smokable flower level, I mean, how do you know you're going to get, like you said, what you, <laughs> what you gave and get it back. So we've ended up having to pretty much do everything in house and it's pretty costly to do that, but you know, that's yeah. the way you can survive. Yeah. I'd like to get um, Dr. Jones response too, if you had something to add. No I, no, I think we're talking about the right things to my, to my mind. Well, maybe in 2019, I think in Southern Oregon, we uh, ran into drying issues as Sandor was, uh, was saying that when they're, it's not, but it's a big project to do. And my sense is that the processors will come along when there's really a market. The processor, there are processors, they will charge you, a, they will toll you a bunch and they will process your material and they'll hand it back to you. And you say, good luck selling this. And, <laughs> and that I think that um, we'll end up in a circumstance where when there are markets and there really is like an obvious like sort of flow through from the field to the processor, to the outlet, that the processors will step in and scale up and fill that space. The processors who I've interacted with closely are feeling like, oh, maybe we, we probably like spent too much on equipment, that we thought this was gonna be huge and everyone was gonna come from every direction to have us process their material. But if there's not a market, you don't take it out of the barn, you leave the, the material there. Okay, thank you. And, you know, Anne forwarded a question, um, go-to source of information. Uh, you know, there's so many information gaps or just not, some of the information is non-existent, but as farmers and as an extension agent, um, where do you guys go for information? Why don't we start with um, 
Dr. Jones, why don't you, <laughs> where do you go for information? Where do I go for information? It's some like funny blending of talking with growers who have, I think in many cases are doing something that works for them. Is it like the best thing to do? Not always sure, but they've got practices that they've been able to make work. And so that's one place. And then I, in my like sort of extension world, I'm going to like sort of basic principles. We know lots about how plants use water and require nutrients. We know lots about weed control practices. Um, and there's ends up being a gap of how exactly does this apply to hemp? But I'm gonna start with those first principles. I'm gonna ask growers what they're doing and then say, well, we're not gonna get a better answer than that. I can tell you about what I know. You should keep doing what you're doing unless this sounds right. It's gonna be a decade before I can give you precise fertilizer requirements for your crop um, in the way I can for basically any other crop. All right, Sandor, where do you go? Uh, it takes a village to do this. I mean, it really does. I mean, I have, you know, I've, like I said, I was involved in cannabis in 93. I still find myself calling, you know, people that I knew 30 years ago and say, hey, I'm up against this and hey, I'm up against that. And, you know, and then I talk to my, you know, we have a local fertilizer dealer who begrudgingly works with organic products because the area is, you know, demanding it now. I mean, he, his initial thing is, oh, you just nuke it with this. And I said, okay, well, we're past that now. Let's get on to, you know, what do we do from here? Um, you know, no, I mean, it's really, it's just a kind of a old fashioned talk over the fence to your neighbor type of situation, honestly, at this point. And, you know, I got my problems and what, you know, and, I mean, you know, corn earworms, I mean, I had them 15 years ago. I didn't even know what they were until the very end of the crop. And then all of a sudden all my flowers started rotting out from the inside. And, you know, we went from, oh, this is going to be a great winter to, well, the kids aren't getting new basketball shoes real quick. So, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just, you know, it's kind of a trial and error type of thing. Um, you know, there's some good consultants out there that, you know, you could, that you could work with, but, you know, I mean, it's just basically, you know, talking with guys that have been in the industry for a long time and you, know, you, you just have to be open with information. I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I deal with some people that don't want to talk about things and well, I don't deal with them anymore because I mean, I'm, I'm more always more than open to have any discussion about, you know, what needs to be done or what, what I think you could do, or, you know, I mean, it's just like, you just you just have to be open I mean, we're kind of a group at this point and i mean that's just how i see it yeah well akasha you've been in this probably longest and you know, longer than anybody where do you go for information i mean i again i think i mean i think sandor really really put that on the heel i mean we we've, we've got our guys that work in the cannabis industry here in carpinteria so it's a simple like when we're in the nursery you know they've been growing cannabis there for four or five six years and yeah, are they using napalm and nuking everything or are they doing it organically? We're growing in the soil also. Um, a lot of the things that Sandor had initially with, it was all flower nurseries originally three, four years ago when we took them over. Um, so we see a lot, of, a lot of issues in there, you know, and we use biologics and beneficials and um, it's trial and error. And it, and it is just literally talking to others that are in this industry. Um, ideally people that are closer to you that have similar issues that are, you know, at least from a pest control. Um, that's been that's been our biggest. Yeah, we have a pretty tight community in Ventura County, and we know all the farmers, and we, we network as much as we can. Um, you know, for what it's worth, I don't know if anybody speaks Chinese, but they've been growing it for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, and I've heard they do have a lot of research on hemp production. And the other good news is that's why Rodell is here. Uh, they really are going to start doing more research, more trials, more testing. Um, it may be kind of a shot in the dark or, or just working with neighbors at this point, but I think the research is going to come real fast. Hmm. Yeah, our, there's a consultant that you work with here. Sorry to interrupt you, but there's, there's a guy, I brought, a friend of mine, George, and you know he was he was a, a lifesaver a few times, but you know, when you get the spider mites and Sanders probably had that too, it's like, oh my God, like, this is insane. I mean, yeah, you're going to cut the tops. You're going to, are you going to spray it with, you know, what are you going to spray on the top to yeah. keep it from infecting? Are you going to keep your, keeping your, your implements and whatever your tools you're using clean and sterilized? And, 
you know, how do you, you know, do you put people in a, in a hazmat suit to go between one house and the next house? I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of what you, it's the practices you put in place, I think will help prevent also. Well, it's all yeah. preventative maintenance. I mean, it's all preventative maintenance. So you, you got to start clean. You got to, you know, yeah. I mean, that's the biggest thing, especially in the greenhouse environment. I, you know, as much as I hate to pay the labor to clean the walls and, you know, and, and get myself ready to go, which, you know, that's what we're doing right now. I mean, it's expensive, but, you know, so, so is russet mites and, you know, so are root aphids. <laughs> I mean, and there's so many things that, that can just dry. I mean, I've seen people with russet mites and root aphids that, you know, have been on a small scale that have repainted everything and re, you know, re just cleaned the whole greenhouse and they re replanted again. And now we have more russet mites. So, oh. you know, it's, like they said, I, I would agree. Starting, you know, just doing your best to stay clean that you can, as you can, right from the start, is very is imperative. Well, so that brings up an interesting question because I've been working in, you know, my background's in IPM, and a little bit more in soils, but um, in IPM, you know, um, and both of you folks are organic, and so there's a very um, especially more recently, there's a real big push to not just be passive organic, meaning like, oh, we won't spray any, you know, chemical fertilizers or, um, or use any chemical fertilizers or uh, synthetic pesticides. Uh, the, the trend is to become more proactive in creating beneficial habitat. And it seems like, and some of the pictures I've seen from, um, Gordon and, and all your pictures, I didn't see any kind of beneficial habitat out there. Like what, uh, and I think that would, it's not a miracle cure, but especially in organics, you know, you need to get some beneficial habitat out there. Otherwise, who's controlling your pests? You got to come in and, and nuke them with even organic pesticides, you know, they're expensive. Why not experiment around with like putting in a row of you know um I, i'm sure phil i've been to your farm you know i think you have hedgerows on the edges mm. but maybe you need to start putting hedgerows more down the middle or mm. you know just give give the beneficials a chance to do the work because they evolved doing this kind of stuff as well uh you know we have to come in with uh artificial means very true. Uh, actually, I have done a little bit more, mainly in strawberries, uh, creating islands right in the middle of the field. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think there should be, one of the areas of research might be a little bit more um, information on, as Sandor mentioned, it's all prevention, right? Uh, not only about pests, but uh, in your soil, uh, if your soils and most of the soils we're working with across the country, they're degraded soils. You know, we've been tilling them and uh, masking kind of poor soil function for decades now. Um, if your soil's in good shape, that's you know, I've, I talk to growers all the time, you know, the, your best pest management strategy is getting your soils up to snuff. And uh, if your soils are in poor shape, your plants are going to be stressed and you're going to invite in trips and mites and all these other critters. So um, I have a few more questions and then uh, we'll get to the um, CDFA and the crop insurance information. But um, I'm kind of wondering, so FDA has not come in in a strong way about uh, livestock feed. And I, I think this might be a, a market um, because you can grow this stuff. I'm really impressed with it takes a 0.3 acre feet uh, down in Ventura County to get a crop off the ground. Um, that's incredible because, you know, in, here in California, we're going through the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, uh, groundwater withdrawals are going to be restricted in the future. Yep. And so uh, this is a very water conserving crop. Where is the regulation on livestock feed? And 
Dr. Jones, maybe start with you. <laughs> you more acquainted yeah, with that. and I won't. I won't be able to get the acronyms right. But there's like a state organ or the an organization of state uh, animal feed control officers that have a list of like acceptable uh, feed additives and hemp and hemp byproducts do not currently appear on that list. And so then I think it's up to the state's departments of agriculture to then make some determination. I think USDA has said like, no, we're not, don't have enough information about, is this spent hemp biomass that's been extracted? Is this hemp plants out of the, out of the field? How much cannabinoid is in, those, uh, in that material that's being fed and what happens to it in the animal? I think there is some evidence that uh, uh, feed cannabinoid uh, laden hemp material to a dairy cow, you will find those cannabinoids in the milk. And understanding those relationships and the consequences thereof is the link. We want to do that before everyone starts feeding, feeding out hemp. But, um, likely valuable in as a feed by itself or in mixed rations. I know Oregon State and uh, Kansas State are doing re doing those trials um, on trying to figure out how the, the fate of the cannabinoids. Right. And we have folks from Kansas on this call, actually. Um, Akasha, have you looked into the livestock feed market? Oh, you're muted, Akasha. Sorry about that. We, we keep trying to do it back and forth with the muting. Um, I, we had actually someone asked me last uh, last week who's got a, a large ranch and uh, was wondering if we could use biomass for feed. And I, I to be honest, with you, I have no idea because that we have a lot of biomass left over from last year. Um, the seed market, you know, for food, I, I, that's something maybe Gordon would mo know more about. I don't, I don't know anybody that's that's requested. It would make sense that it would be something that would be. You know, for dairy farms and 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 cattle ranches, I would think, and even horse. The one thing we did offer was um, the stock fiber. We we did donate some to some uh, equestrian horse uh, ranches that that wanted to basically try it on for the hook for the for the ground cover. You know, in the stalls. Oh, huh. interesting. Sandor, have you looked at that market? Yeah, actually. Um... Gordon, I, I believe Oregon State was doing it on feeder cattle, if, if I remember correctly. I think that they had my, my oldest uh, was going there at the time, and I believe that they told me that they were doing it on feeder cattle. I know right now that they're doing the compressed pellets in for horse feed. Um, for, you know, the older horse with some inflammation issues, and they, you know, so it's actually going for a pretty high penny. I noticed it at the feed store the other day. It was, you know, not cheap. So I think, you know, horses is going to be where they're going to go with it first. And, and if the horses don't die, which we all know they won't, you know, <laughs> after a couple of years of a year or two of the horses not dying, you know, they might look into it more, um, might you know, which is also just another hold back of the FDA, because I mean, if there's, if the CBD or whatever goes through into the meat, I mean, you know, it's just a whole nother market that they would be having really quickly. So it's, it's, it all just goes, honestly, we discussed earlier, it all just goes back to these FDA food regulations. And, and when, when they, you know, the information gets out there, um, you know, it, it'll, things will change. Great. Is it biomass, Sandor, that they're doing the pellets with? They're taking a, a, a high CBD biomass and then just pelletizing it, the mill? Just compressing and pelletizing it, yeah. And I mean, I think a 40 pound bag was like, 30 something dollars. I mean, it was, per, I, I was pretty blown away by the price on it. Yeah. yeah. Well, especially in a state like California, we're a number one dairy state in the union. So there's a lot of potential feed that could be going to dairy cattle, for example. And I know I out in Kansas, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of feed lots out there <clears throat> and um, that could be a potential crop. And uh, a water saving crop too, because the Ogallala is not doing that well out in the Midwest. You know, it's being drained as we speak and uh, not much recharge happening. So, okay. What's, do, does anybody know the water consumption rate of alfalfa uh, in comparison to hemp? I mean, obviously we know that hemp, you know, we don't have a water consumption rate, but I mean, I think alfalfa is a little bit more water loving. Oh yeah. I, I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> 
But certainly and alfalfa uses more water. All right, well, it depends on the year too to get some good rains. I do not know what the average is. It, I, I would guess my brother-in-law grows, um, you know, organic alfalfa. Uh, he's got a farm west of Woodland and, um, you know, they that's flood irrigated, right? So um, I'm guessing a minimum two acre feet a year. And, you know, he gets about eight to, depending on the year, maybe eight to 12 cuttings off of that, you know. So um, there's, it, you know, it produces more biomass for sure, but it certainly sucks up a lot more uh, water. That's for sure. So, all right. Well, um, I'm gonna go back to my presentation and uh, we're gonna move on to um, move on to the next section. Um, and let me introduce the speakers in this section. Um, Lock, I'd like to introduce uh, Locke Fan. Uh, is an environmental scientist at the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And she's been uh, with the industrial hemp program since 2019. She provides support to the county agricultural commissioners and growers regarding the cultivation and industrial hemp uh, in accordance with the Division 24 of California Food and Agricultural Code. And I'm sure she can uh, enlighten us as to what that Division 24 is. And then also I want to introduce um, a colleague of mine and friend, uh, Jeff Shazinski. Uh, he worked, he's been working with NCAT for quite a long time. He's got expertise in organic and sustainable agriculture, public policy, marketing, and economics, uh, GMOs, uh, genetic, genetically modified crops, and organic horticulture, and renewable energy. So he's got a broad background. Uh, he has worked in on regional sustainable ag projects. He's taught at uh, several different um, institutions of higher education up in Montana. He started one of the first CSA, the community supported ag uh, farms in New Jersey uh, back in the day, I think that was last century, Jeff, and then uh, served in the Peace Corps in Belize uh, in Central America and worked on his grandfather's dairy farm in Wisconsin. He holds master, master's degrees in a couple um, areas, ag, economics, and political science as well. So uh, Locke, uh, why don't we go to your presentation? Oh, I need to stop share, sorry. Hello, everyone, and my apologies. I don't have a webcam for my uh, computer, um, but hello, everyone, uh, once more. Uh, my name is Locke Fan. I'm an environmental scientist uh, with the California Department of Food and Agriculture, uh, for the specifically for the industrial hemp program. So I really want to thank NCAT as well as EcoFarms for giving me this opportunity to present to everyone today. Uh, I will be providing a general overview of the program. So. I wanted to start off this presentation with a history of our federal legislation, regulations, as well as our state uh, legislation. Mm -hmm. So Division 24 of the California Food and Agriculture Code, also known as California's Hemp Law, uh, was established by the California Industrial Hemp Farming Act, mm -hmm. Sen uh, or also known as uh, Senate Bill uh, 566 in 2013. But it was, it was inoperative due to a provision in the law. Now, it did not actually come into effect until Prop 64, uh, which we all know as Adult Use of uh, Marijuana Act, uh, which passed uh, in 2017. And so with that, uh, it removed that provision and therefore our Division 24 became operative. So I won't really go into very much detail about the whole history. I really want to concentrate really on the recent changes starting from 2018. So there were both federal and state legislation in 2018. We, uh, as everyone was being speaking of, uh, we had the 2018 Farm Bill, which removed hemp from the Controlled Substance Act. And it also authorized states 
and tribes to regulate hemp cultivation based off of a regulatory plan approved by USDA. And we also ha uh, we had Senate Bill 1409 on the state side, which passed in California, which made changes to clarify enforcement and further uh, implement our program. And in recently in 2019, we had the passage of Senate Bill 153 in California, which add additional changes to mirror the federal requirements. So really to have us to comply with the 2018 Farm Bill uh, uh, requirements for a state regulatory plan. And then, of course, right after Senate Bill uh, 153 was uh, uh, signed off by the governor, USDA established their interim final rules in October of 2019 as well. Uh, and uh, this is federal regulations uh, and not uh, not legislation. Um, but it, it, what the rules did is just provided more details on the requirements for the state and tribal regulatory plan. So what is Division 24 and what's in it? Uh, so this is a summary of the requirements found in Division 24 as we pre uh, previously provided, uh, as I previously provided in the previous slide. Division 24, the California Food and Agricultural Code is the California Industrial Hemp Law. So in this summary, uh, we have a few things. Uh, we have the uh, requirement of having an, an advisory board to provide recommendations related to Division 24 to the Secretary. Uh, the Industrial Hemp Advisory Board is required to meet at least once a year, um, but you know, hemp is a growing industry. And so because of that, they have been meeting uh, very frequent all of our board information, uh, it is on our website. So you can actually watch all of those board meetings if you wanted, because they are recorded. We also have uh, all of the attachments and me meeting minutes that have been approved so far as well. And then of course you have the requirements that anyone who grows industrial hemp would need to register with the local county agricultural commissioner in order to cultivate in the state. And then there's also planting restrictions, like the use of approved cultivars, a planting size requirement, um, testing for THC concentration, and then the destruction of any industrial hemp that tests above that 0.3% THC concentration. Now, currently uh, in our law, there is an exemption for established agricultural research institutions from various requirements. Now the definition of, it's really important is that the definition of established agricultural research institution that is currently in effect at this time includes institution of higher education and anyone who maintains land or facilities for ag research. However, the law also includes a more limited definition that will become operative once the state has an approved regulatory plan uh, by USDA. So here on this slide is the Title III of our California Code of Regulations uh, and what is currently in effect. And so the California Code of Regulations can be found on Westlaw. If not, we also have a copy of our laws and regulations, all of our current laws and regulations on our industrial hemp webpage. And so I wanna go ahead and quickly go through these sections. Um, so section 4900 is regarding our registration fee, which is currently $900 per registration. And if you were growing in multiple counties, it would be, you know, uh, since it's registration at different counties, it would be $900 every time you register for different counties as well. Um, the section 4901 and 4902, which is the requirements for registration applications, as well as the criminal history report. Uh, and that is the background checks that many people speak of. Uh, section 4920, 4921 is regards to the list of approved cultivars, uh, which uh, growers would need and utilize. Um, this, uh, in, a, in addition to that list, it also speaks about the methodology and procedures to amend that list as well. And then finally, we have 4940, 4946, uh, through 4946, 4950, 
4950.1, which is in regards to sampling and testing for TC content. Now, it's really important to note that the last code sections about sampling and testing, we actually have uh, gone through the regular rulemaking for those regulations. And right now, those rule, uh, rulemaking documents are at the Office of Administrative Law for their review and approval. And we, uh, we anticipate uh, we anticipate and we hope uh, to hear back from OAL soon in regards to their determination on those regulations. But our presentation today is just really speaking out about what is currently in effect. So what uh, uh, industrial hemp is defined in our California Food and Agriculture Code in sections 81,000A6. And it's just really important to note uh, that uh, in this definition, it includes the THC limit threshold to be 0.3% for Delta 9 THC. So our program requirements are structured based off of this limit. So we structure everything to ensure that hemp crop that's grown does not exceed this limit. And I do want to note that the federal definition also contains this limit. Uh, of 0.3%. So if the whole registration process is pretty simple. So if someone was interested in growing hemp, uh, they would just need to get the application online from our website. They will fill it out and then submit, submit it to their local county agricultural commissioner along with the $900 registration fee. Um, the commissioner uh, will then review the application, and they are actually the ones who are issuing the proof of registration once all of the requirements are met. So we act, in our law, we have three types of registration, a grower registration, breeder, and established agricultural research institution. However, the re registration for research institutions won't take into effect until we have a state regulatory plan approved by USDA. Um, so part of the registration requirements in the application, the applicant will provide their contact information, cultivation site information, and also a list of varieties that they plan and use. Uh, in addition to that, they would need to also submit a criminal history report for all of their key participants, a boundary map of the cultivation site that they listed, uh, and of course, the registration fee of $900. Uh, it's really important to note that there are a few unique requirements for each of these registrations. So with the growers, um, they need to provide documentation to show that they are using approved uh, variety. So we're re referring to now is section 4920 uh, um, uh, for the list of approved cultivars. Uh, breeders uh, will, uh, will submit a variety development plan and then for research institution, uh, they'll submit a research plan. So as of last week, early last week, we have about a little bit over the, um, 500 registered growers and breeders in California uh, in 34 different counties. Uh, there's a total of about 16,400 uh, acres registered for hemp cultivation. Um, if you look at the map on the right, the counties highlighted in yellow are those that currently have registrants. Uh, we do have, uh, we have a registration summary on our webpage that we uh, try to update monthly. So we, um, so, you know, we do provide that information if you're interested to see where hemp is being grown on a monthly basis. Unfortunately, at this time, uh, we don't have planted uh, uh, acres uh, to report, um, but once we our emergency our proposed regulations do come in fact, we should have that kind of information. So this next slide here kind of prov uh, it provides a general overview of the sampling and testing process prior to harvest. So registered growers will need to provide a pre-harvest report to the commissioner at least 30 days out from when they uh, plan to begin harvest. The commissioner 
or uh, a third party sampler would uh, designate it by the commissioner is responsible for collecting those samples at least 10 days before the anticipated harvest. Now, once collected, that sample would be delivered within 24 hours of collection and the laboratories have 10 days to prepare and test the sample. At this time, those laboratory must be an ISO IEC 17025 accredited laboratories for THC analysis. Um, these requirements, uh, um, so based off of those results from those test reports, the grower can either harvest, resample, or destroy the crop. Now, at this time, the, the requirement and the process that I'm speaking of is based off of our emergency regulations that are in effect. Um, as, we, uh, as previously discussed in our regulation side, uh, we did submit rulemaking documents to the Office of Administrative Law. And so this process will be subjected to change once those regulations are in effect. So, it, after a grower has received their test report, um, many few things can happen. So if the test report passed, so it had a result that was no more than 0.3%, the grower can harvest up to 30 days from the sampling collection date. So they can harvest uh, once they have that test report and then they can harvest until 30 days from that sampling collection date. Now, if the test results show that the crop was found to be greater than 0.3% uh, THC, but no more than 1%, then the grower has an opportunity to resample and retest. If the second test report uh, passes, then of course the grower can uh, harvest up to 30 days from the resampling collection date. If the second test report though, does not show a passing THC level, THC level, where it is once more greater than 0.3%, but no more than 1%, then they will need to complete um, harvest within 45 days from the receipt of the lab test report. Now, if a lab test report indicates a THC content that is above the 1%, then uh, the grower has no option. They will need to destroy. And that destruction needs to start within 48 hours and complete it within seven days from the receipt of lab report. So the first three uh, three section that you speak uh, that you see is referring to when a grower receives a test report. Now the other two section is destructions for other reasons. So the first reason is for non-compliance. So the the cultivation of that crop was not in compliance with Division 24 of the Food Agricultural Code or Title III of the Code of, uh, uh, California Code of Regulations. With that, um, the grower will receive an abatement notice and they will then be required to um, destroy um, 45 days from that receipt of the abatement notice. And that abatement notice would be coming from their county agricultural commissioner. And then of course, we do understand that growers may also choose to voluntarily destroy their crop, um, you know, due to a variety of reasons. Maybe uh, they had a bad crop yield, uh, the crop was infested, or they were uh, with uh, pests and diseases, or maybe they were just roguing out male plants. Uh, then in that, in this case, the grower then will uh, have no time frame requirements, but, uh, um, but it would be based off of the destruction plan that they will be providing. So I will let you know that all these destruction requires that the cultivator, the grower, to submit a destruction plan at least 24 hours prior to the start of the destruction for the county to then review and approve. So the destruction plan has to be reviewed uh, by the county and have it approved before that destruction can begin. So at the beginning of our presentation, uh, we did speak about the federal requirements and about the state regulatory plan approved by USDA. So what is our CDFA status on this? Uh, we have submitted a state plan to USDA for review. We will inform the public once our plan has uh, been approved, and I will let you know how you can receive that notification at the end of our presentation. Um, 
since based off of USDA's webpage uh, for their hemp production um, website, uh, since California does not have an approved plan, growers are not required to follow the requirements outlined in federal interim final rules because we have submitted a plan, but they can still apply for the USDA hemp production license if they wish. But regardless of any federal requirements, all hemp growers in California must comply with existing state laws and regulations, as well as any local restrictions that may apply. And then on this slide here, we wanted to kind of give um, uh, everyone some regulatory consideration for hemp that is within CDFA. So of course, everybody was speaking about previously uh, new pests and diseases found on hemp and cannabis. It's really unknown as to what hemp and cannabis can be a host of, uh, as Gordon was speaking of, and as well as the other farmers. Uh, you know, we had the European corn borough as well as cannabis aphid being found here in California. Uh, if you were a uh, if you are a hemp grower and you're planning to sell hemp nursery stock or hemp seeds, a license to sell nursery stock uh, or the authorization to sell seed is required as well. Uh, we also have the licensing to handle manufacture process and sell of hemp farm products for the purpose of resell or processing. And that goes through our CDFA's market enforcement branch. And then of course, organic certification through our organics program here. And then uh, the sales of hemp and hemp products as certified farmers market, which we also have a certified farmers market program here in CDFA. And so we do provide many information on our webpage. Uh, on our webpage, you can actually find our current laws and regulations and extensive frequently asked questions um, that encompasses not just cultivation of industrial hemp, but also uh, in kind of questions about importing and exporting hemp, as well as manufacturing and processing uh, hemp uh, as well. Uh, all of our applications and forms are found on our website as well, our board meeting information. And then here, I really want to point out is uh, the sign up to receive updates. So on there, you can subscribe to our public listserv. Mm -hmm. This is how we notify the public of any changes and updates to our program. So uh, when our state plan gets approved, when we have public comment period or adoptions of any emergency or regular uh, uh, regular rulemaking and such, all of that is, uh, is through that public listserv and I highly encourage everyone to sign up on it if you're you know, really wanting to know what's going on with our program. And on our website as well, we actually posted our proposed state regulatory plan for the public to review. Uh, I do want to note that it does specify that uh, look at those footers in our plan because uh, it does include proposed language uh, for certain regulations and those are not in effect. Uh, it's something, it, it's all, it's what we're anticipating to propose, but it may still be subjected to changes. Um, and then of course, uh, since registration is with the County Agriculture Commissioner, uh, we have a link on our webpage as well uh, as to uh, the contact information for each county, uh, including their website links as well. And that's the web address there. And then if you have any questions for our program or any general questions about our laws and regulations, you can feel free to email us at industrialhemp at cdfa.ca.gov. Or you can also call us at 916-654-0435. And that concludes my presentation. And I'll leave it uh, the slide here just so that if you wanted to jot down our contact information. Thank you, Locke. And um, actually, Jeff had a, um, a stream of questions. But one of them, I think, is um, primary is that um, what defines destruction of the crop. I mean, can you use it as a cover crop to plow down in case the THC level is above 0.3%? So, so destruction is required in our law. It specifies that. And if we're with the um, 
USDA and, and how they are promulgating their regulations at this time. Um, they do provide suggestions as to what that destruction can be. And if our proposed regulations do come in effect, it does require us to meet those requirements. And I'm not sure if a cover crop is one of those options, Rex. I would have to double check. Well, I mean, I use the word cover crop, but it's, um, do they have to burn it? Do they have to harvest it and burn it? Or do, can they just plow it down into the soil? Yeah, that is an, an, an option. So it's, it is okay. an option that they can till it in. Inside. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a basic question. Okay, very good. Yeah, but once again, our, yeah, our plan, but the plan is approved by the commissioner. So I'm not quite sure if, you know, you know, if they have any kind of local restrictions as to what kind of methodology that can be used, but it would have to be, uh, but I, from my understanding, tilling is, could be an option. Right, okay. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I think, uh, Jeff, you can, we'll turn the program over to you. And, and I would note that, um, so Locke, if you could stop your share and then um, Jeff can get, his screen on. Um, one of the things of a, of a young volatile market like this is risk. And it's a huge, it, you know, growers are taking on a huge risk as, as uh, Akasha and Sandor pointed out and, and Phil too. Um, and crop insurance is one way to kind of mitigate this risk. And so Jeff will be talking about that. And so Jeff, welcome. Thank you everyone here, everyone unmuted. Check. Am I on mute? We can hear you. It's good. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, um, my name is Jeff Shazinski. I'm an uh, agricultural and natural resource economist, as Rex said, and I've done many, many things over my long life. Um, and I've also spent part of almost 16 years studying crop insurance, and specifically in crop insurance in the organic sector, which one might think one was crazy for doing such a thing. And sometimes I think that myself. Um, my outline is I'm just gonna give some basics on insuring hemp. And what is surprising to me is that not many people realize this is even possible. I'll be talking mostly about federally uh, subsidized crop insurance programs. Um, it's important to note that most crop insurance is federally subsidized that people use meaning that taxpayers pay for a substantial amount of the premium cost. And, uh, and so it's a lower cost program for folks. And, it, and, it, and because it is subsidized, the, there's a relationship uh, between the private and public sector. There are private companies, uh, they're called accredited insurance providers who provide the programs, the subsidized programs, but they're also private ones. So, I'm gonna talk about the two that are available for hemp. One's called actual production history or APH. The other one is whole farm revenue protection, which is a very, very different way of insuring uh, crops. And then there is a private product that I learned since uh, getting back into this a bit, that this is probably not available this year, although it was last year and I'm not quite sure how well it was used. And it's a very interesting approach, but I'm not gonna cover that here because it's it's a very different, again, it's, it's totally private and it is, was available and it's kind of available, but not too readily available. So I'm not gonna go there and some basic things about getting a quote and then some take homes. Uh, jargon, uh, crop insurance, a jargon ridden field. And I hope I'm not using too many of those jargonistic words. But one thing that is important is distinguish revenue risk and yield risk. Revenue risk includes both the risks that are associated with yield and price, and yield is the one that we most think of. You know, a drought causes your crop to, then you get some uh, repayment for that loss, um, and that's usually related to, and it is affected by yield, and that's that kind of risk. But revenue increases, revenue is essentially price times yield, that's your revenue, and, it, and, and there are, of course, when a farmer plants and when he harvests, the price can change and there's risks, therefore, in the price volatility of the crop you grow. And this might be important for um, hemp. Uh, and the, the, the issue there is, is that there aren't many, as many 
and there isn't a, a, for hemp in particular, a revenue-based product. Now, corn, soybeans, cotton, they all have revenue policies which assure from risks that are both yield and, uh, and uh, price related. And Whole Farm does too, which we'll get into later. Uh, risk Management Agency is the USDA agency that fundamentally develops all the rules and really in a sense controls all federally subsidized crop insurance programs. And accredited insurance providers, as I said, are there only 14 of them. They're the private countries who in a relationship with the federal government service the policies, run the policies and actually share in some of the benefits and risks of crop insurance. Uh, so uh, beginning last year, an APH action reduction or yield risk hemp policies were available in the United States, but in only certain counties in the United States in every state. The unit of analysis in crop insurance is the county. You can have a certain policy in one county in a state and it won't be available in the next county in the state. So it's very hard for one to say, is something covered unless you actually look down to the county level? And that's doable by the website, but, um, but it's not a simple thing to do. And, and as we will find with hemp in California, there's only certain counties where it's available. Um, there's, and when this was made available for yield risk in certain counties in the United States, it, um, it has some certain, certain restrictions that aren't necessarily true of all APH or yield history programs uh, that for other crops. Again, applying with the regulations, which we just have heard about, have at least one, history, one year of history producing the crop. That might be, so it's not immediately available for a beginning hemp grower. Uh, planted in a field. Uh, be, uh, so I, I, I'm assuming that might then affect greenhouse production. Be a variety adaptable in the area, be grown under a contract. This is really important thing, both for whole farm and for yield is that you must be grown under a processor contract. Um, and that may be not available for everyone. Be planted for harvest as hemp in accordance with, again, the requirements of that process. So you can't deviate from that. And be planted to a minimum of five acres or 20 acres for grain and fiber. And it's interesting, they do constrain practices, cannot be interplanted with another crop uh, in a established which is a, actually is a problem for a lot of other crops too. So these are the countries. Um, you can find this on the RMA website and anyone who's interested can contact me and I can work with them if they need to know. But these are the counties where it's available. I was trying to look at that map and the ones where, they, where you actually have it requires, they seem to be a little bit of overlap, but probably not entirely. Why only these counties? I don't know the answer to that. It, it's some bureaucrat decided, um, probably because there was some history of growing cannabis or hemp previously in those. Maybe that's where the piloted programs were previous to, to the, the change in the 2018 Farm Bill. Probably the number one of those, those reasons. Uh, basic, again, it's a yield risk policy only. It does not, if you have change in price during the year, it's not going to cover that loss. Action protection ensures against yield loss is due to natural causes. These are often called multiple peril uh, policies because any of these per perils. Uh, and the producer selects the amount of an average yield to insure from 50 to 75%, in some areas up to 85% covered. No crop insurance policy in the United States covers, well, there's a little stipulation, uh, sometimes up to 90 with an additional provisional policy, but around 85% is the maximum. So you never get full coverage of 100% loss, uh, but it, hemp is limited to 75%. So in general, if you think about that, that means that you're, you, you could have 25% loss and not really see any benefits from insurance. The producer also likes the percent of the predicted price to insure between 55 and 100% of the crop's price. This is established by RMA. And they, they actually differentiate these um, projected prices from the different kinds of uh, the flour, the, the grain, and uh, the fiber. They're distinguished in, in, in terms of the prices. Um, how they come up with these prices is amazing to me. Um, 
Um, I don't know how they do it. Uh, they probably use the best available evidence to do it. And I'm sure they're probably lower than some people actually experience, which could also affect whether one will want to use this program or not. If the harvest price, any appraisal production is less than the yield ensured, the producers pay the dividend based on the difference. So in other words, it, it, you basically, that's how you are paid. I calculate by the difference between that price that was established and the loss that was substantiated. Now, whole farm is the other way to ensure him, but it's not, you, whole farm revenue is unfortunately, I think, in my opinion, not utilized by many farmers in the country and certainly not utilized by many farmers, even in California, even though it's available, and this is an important point, in every single county in California. So technically speaking, anyone can sure hemp in any county in the state of California if they do it through whole farm revenue, not through a yield risk. And as it states, it's farm revenue, it also protects against both yield and price risk, which is a, an advantage. Uh, and, it can, and it can be sure, insured in this way because whole farm revenue is really ensuring the potential of the farm to produce revenue based on its historical record of being able to produce revenue. And so you're essentially ensuring the revenue, not any specific crop. And therefore hemp can be one of those crops that the whole farm produces. And so again, that, that's a very different way of thinking about crop insurance. You're not ensuring the hemp, but you're ensuring it as part of your overall operation. And there could be some advantages to that because maybe if you're trying hemp, and you want to ensure other things, you can ensure the whole kit and caboodle at the same time. Um, for the 2020 year, um, it's again, uh, it's available for fiber, flower, and seed in all counties in California under whole farm. And yield is available for the 2021 for flower in those counties I mentioned. Uh, hemp coverage restrictions, again, produce, if they have a contract for the purchase of the in hemp, meet all applicable state, the laws that we just discovered, we just, just discussed, and provisions state that the hemp having, this is the clear, the THC, hot hemp, is not an insurable cause of risk. Say that again, the THC above that is not an insurable cause of risk. And of course, this may be one of the greatest risks, but it's one that is not covered. And so again, a whole farm can be any crop or livestock product. Um, there's a couple of things like pet animals, you can't do that. Does not cover on-farm value added products. Grapes, not grape jam. So if you were to take your hemp and make it into a product and then sell it, you would have to take out the value added and only be ensuring the actual productive thing under whole farm particularly. It's again, all counties and again, any marketing retail chain can be uh, the, the, anyway, it doesn't matter where you sell it in terms of getting insurance for your production. Uh, again, whole farm is the only federal option for many crops in many counties. So again, all those counties that you can't get yield insurance or the AP insurance is available for whole farm to be insured. Provides insurance for diverse operations. It, it, it's kind of made somewhat for at least some diverse operations because again, it doesn't insure any specific crop, but it the whole farm's capacity to generate revenue. So, so some things may go up, some things may go down, but you are kind of secure in the revenue uh, risk that you're taking overall. Uh, and, and in a sense, organic prices is embedded to the extent that your history has been growing organic and your revenue has generated organic value, that is the basis upon which you ensure your revenue and therefore it's embedded that is organic value because it's likely to be higher. Uh, having crop insurance can assist in qualifying for loans. And that's another reason why you might, can, although we found that again, in this discussion that banks and others are not necessarily so interested in uh, supporting hemp, but having an insurance backing up may make it more likely or possible. I'm not advancing for some reason. Oh, there we go. How to request a quote, um, crop, first you gotta get a crop insurance agent. Uh, this website, this, uh, this tool is really, really good. It even tells you if there's a Spanish language spoken at the 
agent's location and you can just go on and it's, it's a pretty neat, it's actually been improved over the years and it's a pretty neat fund to find a crop insurance agent. So you have to do that. Um, the other thing is that I wanna talk a little bit about agents. I mean, again, hemp, like everything being new, both whole farm revenue and even the uh, yield APH policies are probably not too many of those have been written. Uh, in fact, I looked and there, the very limited uh, amount have been, were, were actually taken out uh, for APH hemp in California. There were some, but it's like 10 or something like that. It's a very small number. Um, so it has not been sold readily, which will make most crop insurance agents nervous, as will Whole Farm, because they haven't utilized that as much and as often. They probably have not used it with hemp. So therefore, uh, they'll be a little bit nervous. However, if these are federally subsidized programs. They must provide a quote. They must work with you. But again, if a guy is if an agent is balking, you want to work with one who is willing and interested in helping rather than one who's going to kind of you know, say, oh, this is crazy, don't go with it. So really, you know, kind of shop around for your agent. Um, this is something I tell everyone when I do crop insurance talks is that, you know, it's great. You get your product, you think you know what you're being insured and you know all that. But remember that when you make a claim, there's a process. And if anybody has gone through any kind of insurance claims for any product, and I'm not just talking about agriculture, you will know that then is the time when you must substantiate your loss. And there's even a rule that you must, you have a loss, it's either price and or yield related, depending on whether you have a whole farm or the yield, you must report that loss 72 hours in advance of the loss. And you must document your loss and do that carefully because just like all insurance, the, 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 the insurance folks, the companies, and this is not the federal government, it's the companies, they have very, all the fine print, they are not, you know, they're not necessarily trying to find you the best indemnity payment or pay you out to the most. They, they are going to be scrupulous about making sure that you get paid what you deserve to get paid. And that is often contested. And so therefore having evidence is very important. Um, the closing date is still available for both APH and Whole Farm Revenue in California. It's 228 coming up. So if you're interested in getting insurance, find an agent, talk to them, give them, get them to run a quote for both APH if you're in that county or Whole Farm Revenue. And you decide whether it's beneficial or not for you. Terminate details of kind of accumulation. Um, okay, so sharing between you and the agent and the provider, be satisfied that you are getting what you want. Basically that you are ensuring that you know what your historic approved revenue will be, that the level of insurance is what you want, that, that if you had 100% loss, you know that would be worth the cost of it. Um, again, APHM provides only yield risk, whereas whole farm does the price risk. Whole farm is not designed for a single crop like hemp, but really for the whole farm. So they will take a little more work to, to run a quote for whole farm with the inclusion of hemp in your, in your farm. But again, it needs to be, can be done by your, your agent. Uh, crop insurance is often needed, again, for the loans and good record keeping. It's particularly true for whole farm revenue they have to document all the historic crops you did and what you expect to get in the future. So there's a little bit of a process there, particularly for whole farm. And it would be a little bit easier, but again, that would depend on your own history. Uh, we have lots of things on our ATRA publication on crop insurance. Like I wrote all of those. So anyway, uh, they're there and um, you can always contact me we also ran a program, a project uh, that was five years. Is organic farming risky? It, uh, it's an excellent book uh, on understanding the, both the history, research, and some practical uh, aspects of uh, organic farming insurance. And we have, again, all the publications and, that we have. And there's my contact information. Again, I put it in the chat. Feel free to call me anytime uh, to talk about this. I enjoy talking about it. Thanks. Jeff, thank you very much. That was pretty enlightening, although, um, but I would, I have a question. Can you 
discuss briefly about uh, kind of cropping history for, with the whole farm revenue, uh, because so many farmers don't have much of a cropping history with hemp. I mean, how how far back do they have to go to um, provide kind of information about revenues um, to qualify if they want to grow hemp, say, um, next year, but they haven't grown it previously, are, would, they be avail, would they be able to avail themselves of WFRP? Absolutely, they would. And it's a bit confusing because, again, I think the, the thought process always is that we're covering the crop, aren't we, when we cover insurance? And we're not really covering the crop with whole farm revenue. We're, we're covering the history and the potential of the farm to produce a revenue. And it doesn't, doesn't say, it, they will look, of course, they will, they, they determine your, your capacity to generate a revenue based on your taxes, not on a farm plan. So if you have five years of history and you were, let's just say you, your average approved revenue was 100,000 over the last five years. Again, whole, I, I should have been clear, whole farm revenue cannot be acquired by somebody in their very, very first year of operation. And if they're a beginning farmer, which is defined as 10 years or less of farming, then they can do it with three years of actual, they have to have been a farmer for three years. So if you're a first year farmer, and that's not growing hemp or anything, just for whole farm, it, 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 you can't get whole farm at all unless you have three years of revenue generation potential. So that is one limitation of farm. So yes, it's available in every county, but it's only to quote farmers with at least three years of historical experience growing. And then that basis becomes your approved revenue. Then when you go to calculate what your expected revenue is, then you can include hemp in there if that's your first year growing it. Now the way they will determine the value of that will be something called a T or county average yield, which they actually have in every county in California. Now, you might ask, well, how the heck do they know what the average county yield of hemp is in every county in California? And <laughs> they made some really pretty good guesstimates, uh, but they're there and they were estimated. Whether they're legit or not, I don't know. And if you look at them as an experienced hemp grower, I'd be interested in saying whether those seem even legitimate, but they have come up with them. And that will be the basis of determining the value of the hemp in the year of the insurance. But usually that's a lower, and you're, 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 anyway, I'm getting complicated here very quickly, but the short answer is yes. You can be a first, if you have the three years of historical growing, you can include hemp in your year of insurance and it will be covered again as part of the whole farm's revenue. Okay, well, thank you. Um, let me see, I'm trying to get my screen to advance to, There we go. Um, so um, we're heading on to the very end of the presentation now. And um, Jeff, th again, thank you very much for that. I mean, uh, crop insurance is kind of an esoteric kind of thing, uh, but in a risky market like this, uh, it might be a good thing to just look into it at the very least. And Locke, uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation on CDFA rules and regs that uh, provided some really good resources for interested folks. Um, <clears throat> please uh, do take time to go to this uh, survey monkey, this uh, valuation. Uh, we're required to um, provide the extension risk management education folks with some uh, some evaluations from participants of these events but also it will help inform future events. Like if you're a farmer uh, growing hemp, what information do you need or what information is most important to you? And then we will uh, focus on those types of information in the next um, events. So uh, I think unless there's any other final questions, um, if you would post them to the chat, uh, we can get some uh, responses to you. I think um, 
several of our, of our presenters are are no longer online, but um, thank you all for participating. It's been uh, to me very enlightening, and I, I had a little bit of a background on hemp. But um, if you have any questions for uh, Akasha or any of the other presenters, uh, now's the time, uh, Sandor. Um, actually, there was a question for Sandor um, from Seth Rosmarin, who's really been a good, active, um, informational participant. Um, said, okay, thanks, Bogdan. But the COA is for the cannabinoids. Uh, same goes for the cultivar like the cannabinoid profile will be assigned to that specific cultivar. Sandor, do you understand that question? And can you interpret it for <laughs> us, uh, Damon? Well, I mean, it's, I, I believe his question was about California certified seeds. And uh, I mean, that when, when you try and bring a seed in from out of state, or I, I believe there are actually some California certified seeds right now, but there certainly aren't very many to speak of. Um, but if you, I mean, I brought seeds in from out of state. So you just have to go to your um, local ag commissioner and just say, look at these are the seeds that I brought in. Uh, here's the COA that shows the flower uh, cannabinoid test on this crop. And then they'll okay. Then they'll, I mean, it's it's a pretty basic process to bring seeds into California. They just want to know where they're coming from, if they're hot or not, and uh, you know, and that, that's about the extent of it. it. It wasn't a real big, it wasn't a real big hurdle to jump over. I, I would honestly say that the whole uh, obtaining a permit process and and getting your seeds okayed by the uh, local egg commissioner. I, I, I mean, I think we probably did it in two or three days. It, it, was, it was pretty benign. Okay, thank you. And mm -hmm. just um, since we do have a couple minutes before the 12 o'clock um, expiration date, I guess, um, I, I do have a couple more questions. And um, one of them is uh, if you could influence, if you could have influence on what hemp researchers were doing, what kinds of information or resources would you ask them to develop? And Sandor, start with you and then go to Akasha and uh, Phil. Well, you guys, we brought up, a, we uh, kind of touched on it in something that's kind of dear to me. I, I would really like more studies to be done on animal feeds. Um, you know, closer, planting, you know, like they were saying 36 inches to 48 inches, you know, in between plants. I mean, if you look at the Chinese market and the industrial market, I mean, they, they have about six inches in <laughs> between plants. And uh, they're, that's why when they're able to run combines on them and, you know, the combine can actually handle the stalk because it's really not much bigger than a, than a corn stalk. Um, so for a lot of parts of our country, you know, the smokable flower thing, it's here for now, and who knows how long it's going to be here, but it's really going to get more down to the boutique level. I mean, as for hemp for a, you know, a real industrial type crop, I mean, we, re we really need to look to these other countries that have been doing it for 100 years. And, you know, and, and they're obviously in China, they're not out there cutting industrial hemp down by hand. I mean, they're, it's all mechanized, and they have the proper headers to do it. And so, you know, I, I think I, I would love to see more uh, information come out on animal feeds for sure. I mean, I, I really think that the, the dairy industry and the, and the beef cattle industry, I, I think the sky's the limit with that. And and that six inch spacing, is that for a fiber crop or what? what, what is their market well, for that? For, that's how they do fiber crops, is, you know, and, and you could also do, uh, you know, you could do animal feed crops as well that way. Okay. You know, they just, they, they just go a little bit faster, you know, it's, they just kind of go, it's just a little bit faster of an ordeal. They're not, you know, I mean, and, and the same thing with us with these auto flowers that we have. I mean, there's definitely a great opportunity depending on your region of the country to get two, three, four crops off a year. I mean, you know, that that's kind of what I'm leaning towards now going forward is I would like to see myself have weekly harvests of, you know, take down two or three houses every week and replant. And that way I don't have this huge crop coming down on my head all at one time because you know as we all know having tens of thousands of pounds coming down on you at one time is just just, just with well, two weeks to harvest is just it's an absolute nightmare so you know with that with the 
the auto flowers are starting to catch up. I mean, you know, as a caution, Phil said, they're still genetically, oh, they're kind of all over the place, but you know, I've, I've got a couple, got a couple of auto flower, uh, organic auto flower producers in the Salinas Valley area that are starting to show some, you know, pretty nice, pretty nice results with, with what they have. So, you know, I think just the easier we can make it for ourselves, the better off it's going to be. I mean, that's just, you know, as, as with any type of farming and, and then we're still in a, learn as we go type of situation, but, uh, you know, just, you just got to make it easier on ourselves. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, uh, Akasha or Phil, do you, what, uh, if you could influence what hemp researchers were looking at, what, what would be your druthers? I would just say there's still a little ways to go with fertilizer and pest control. Uh, <laughs> just, just a little ways. <laughs> there are a little ways to go. Uh, I, hoping that uh, the research that Rodell is going to be doing will help out on that. But, um, you know, I remember the days when things were planted on single rows. Uh, I remember when 40 inch beds, two rows per bed, it was uh, a big deal. And so I, I get the row spacing and I get the plant spacing, but I really do believe there's still you know, research we can do on that too to see, because there's CBD fiber. Uh, there's so much and food, yeah, yeah, and food. Uh, I, I don't. There's a lot of research we need. I, I don't know where to start. <laughs> well, it sounds like genetics. You know, like getting, sure. you know, sure. genetics for the food part, for the fiber part, for the yeah. flower part. And they're all going to have different spacings and different beds and. Yeah. Yeah. Akasha. Uh, I mean, I think what both have you both of you have said is is right on. I mean, it 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 um and I don't say the government has to help or corporations have to help, but you know, subsidizing you know these research institutes or research so that we can look at, you know, doing hemp insulation and I mean I really think the building aspect of it too is huge component to the success of this of this crop and and you know we did have a, a number of um we had two nonprofit groups that we gave or well, one nonprofit another group that we gave um that were doing some studies and tests on you know providing hemp insulation in some assisted homes using the stock that we provided them and you know hempcrete and you know it comes down to just having the, the infrastructure to, to, to support yeah. these type of activities. And right now it's all being funded by, you know, individuals like ourselves. And, you know, I think that's the next wave it, and we may not be the ones that are doing it. We took all the arrows, <laughs> but um, you know, at least that's probably the next, that's probably the next step I think that's happening and it'll both, you know, from a food and how do we be competitive? I mean, I, how, how can America, is this is this a security? Is is food production something we consider to be a national security? Is it important to us to to and we and this has all been talked about with farming for the last century? I mean, is it important to us to be able to provide our own food and and material that we need to support and run our society, or are we going to take it from other countries all the time? And you know, China subsidized most of this, not to mention their labor labor wages, but I mean they subsidized a lot of this infrastructure to be able to do it and i think if we really want to be competitive you know and i, I don't know how we compete labor wise but if we want to be competitive at least in being able to provide some of this food and medicine and i mean i do have people that call us and say look i, I want to buy your product you know because i don't trust how it's being grown in china now granted most of the stuff that's coming from china medicinally is isolate and you know it might have all been yeah. taken out, whatever whatever impurities might have been taken out of there. But they also there's also kind of a you know are we are we being stewards? You know are, are we you know do we want to to bring back you know sustainability to to farming? And part of it is an economic aspect too that we have to look at. But I think there's also just you know consciously if we can afford it, how do we do it? So a, a good think tank coming together, both government, corporation, and, you know, and farming to, to help really, I love that, that movie, I keep kiss the ground, you know, and Rodale's presented in that. I mean, I just think it's, 
hemp is dead on to being what we can do to help, you know, heal this planet and heal ourselves. So, yeah. you, know, yeah. study, well. you know, Rodale's doing some study. I'm just, I, I jumped off the call here. Rodale's, you know, talking about taking a couple acres. We're doing a cover crop in our back 30 acres right now. And, you know, she wants to crimp it, just leave it and try some testing. We're just, you know, can we, can we do direct seed on an acre or two and then keep one bed, you know, also keeping a bed also just as it is without disking or tilling it and just, you know, doing these kind of tests. But how do you extrapolate that to big ag? I, I don't know yet. Yeah, I think that's, right. the, that's Rodale's, one of their mission. Well, and, and uh, the farmers generally are the ones on the bleeding edge of, of information development. And um, how does hemp, how can hemp perhaps fit into any of, you know, California has over 450 different crops, but the Midwest could certainly use with some diversification from corn, soybean, wheat, uh, okay. you know, and uh, hemp would be a great uh, crop to, but how do, how can hemp fit into a rotation? Uh, there's, there's still a lot of unanswered questions, I guess. And, um, but I think it can help heal the planet too, you know, and it's a good crop to, uh, re help revitalize our degraded soils. And, um, I, I take your point very well, Akasha, as well as, uh, Sandor, you know, I think, uh, it can extract, a uh, bunch of toxins, and then we got to figure out what to do with them after. But uh, you can't just till it back in. That's the problem. You yeah, know, you that's to, right. <laughs> technically, you should remove it to a hazardous waste material site. Yep. yep. Which is the, the logistics on that are you know that that's that's beyond scope. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we've come to the end of this. Uh, it's twelve o'clock noon, and uh, I. Sure appreciate uh, participants hanging in there. Uh, it's been three hours of pretty information dense download. And, but I really want to um, applaud uh, Sandor, you and Akasha and uh, Phil and Jeff and um, Dr. Gordon, uh, as well as Locke uh, Fan to, uh, for presenting this information. It's much needed and hopefully, in, and please don't forget to Go to the Survey Monkey evaluation. Uh, that will inform future events, and I hope uh, they're as good and information dense as this. And so, thank you all. Um, any last words? Rex, thank you for putting it all together. You're you're the one that did it. Thank you. Well, <laughs> it takes a village, right? <laughs> it does. We'll see you all, right. all later. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Be safe. Bye. Bye.